Eugene Onegin by Alexander Pushkin Translated by James E. Fallon and read to you by Stephen Fry This recording has been produced by Digital October by arrangement with the Oxford University Press. Pétri de vanité, il avait encore plus de cette espèce d'orgueil qui fait avouer avec la même indifférence les bonnes comme les mauvaises actions, suite d'un sentiment de supériorité peut-être imaginaire, tiré d'une lettre particulière. Dedication Not thinking of the proud world's pleasure, but cherishing your friendship's claim, I would have wished a finer treasure to pledge my token to your name, one worthy of your soul's perfection, the sacred dreams that fill your gaze, your verses' limpid, live complexion, your noble thoughts and simple ways. But let it be. Take this collection of sundry chapters as my suit half humorous, half pessimistic, blending the plain and idealistic, amusements yield the careless fruit of sleepless nights, light inspirations born of my green and withered years, the intellect's cold observations, the heart's reflections writ in tears. Chapter One To live he hurries, and to feel makes haste. Prince Vazimsky. My uncle, man of firm convictions, by falling gravely ill, he's won a due respect for his afflictions, the only clever thing he's done. May his example profit others. But, God, what deadly boredom, brothers, to tend a sick man night and day, not daring once to steal away. And, oh, how base to pamper grossly and entertain the nearly dead, to fluff the pillows for his head and pass him medicines morosely while thinking under every sigh, the devil takes you, uncle, die. Just so a youthful rake reflected, as through the dust by post he flew, by mighty Zeus's will elected sole heir to all the kin he knew. Ludmilla's and Ruslan's adherence, without a foreword's interference, may I present, as we set sail, the hero of my current tale. Onegin, my good friend and brother, was born beside the neighbor's span, where maybe, reader, you began, or sparkled in one way or other. I too there used to saunter forth, but found it noxious in the north. An honest man, who'd served sincerely, his father ran up debts galore. He gave a ball some three times yearly, until he had no means for more. Fate watched Eugene in his dependence. At first, Madame was in attendance, and then Monsieur took on the child, a charming lad, though somewhat wild. Monsieur Labbé, a needy fellow to spare his charge excessive pain, kept lessons light and rather plain. His views on morals ever mellow, he seldom punished any lark, and walked the boy in Letney Park. But when the age of restless turnings became in time our young man's fate, the age of hopes and tender yearnings, Monsieur Labbé was shown the gate. And here's Onegin, liberated, to fad and fashion newly mated, a London dandy, hair all curled, at last he's ready for the world. In French he could and did acutely express himself, and even write. In dancing, too, his step was light, and bows he had mastered absolutely. Who'd ask for more? The world could tell that he had wit and charm as well. We've all received an education in something, somehow, have we not? So thank the Lord that in this nation a little learning means a lot. Onegin was, so some decided, strict judges not to be derided, a learned, if pedantic sort. He did possess the happy thought of free and easy conversation, or in a grave dispute he'd wear the solemn expert's learned air and keep to silent meditation. 
and how the lady's eyes he lit with flashes of his sudden wit. The Latin vogue today is waning, and yet I'll say on his behalf he had sufficient Latin training to gloss a common epigraph, cite juvenile in conversation, put vale in a salutation, and he recalled, at least in part, a line or two of Virgil's art. He lacked, it's true, all predilection for rooting in the ancient dust of history's annals full of must, but knew by heart a fine collection of anecdotes of ages past, from Romulus to Tuesday last. Lacking the fervent dedication that sees in sounds life's highest quest, he never knew, to our frustration, a dactyl from an anapest. Theocritus and Homer bored him. But reading Adam Smith restored him, and economics he knew well, which is to say that he could tell the ways in which a state progresses, the actual things that make it thrive, and why for gold it need not strive when basic products it possesses, his father never understood, and mortgaged all the land he could. I have no leisure for retailing the sum of all our hero's parts, but where his genius proved unfailing, the thing he'd learned above all arts, what from his prime had been his pleasure, his only torment, toil and treasure, what occupied the livelong day, his languid spirit's fretful play, was love itself, the art of ardour, which Ovid sang in ages past, and for which song he paid at last by ending his proud days a martyr in dim Moldavia's vacant waste, far from the Rome his heart embraced. How early on he could dissemble, conceal his hopes, play jealous swain, compel belief, or make her tremble, seem cast in gloom, or mute with pain, appear so proud or so forbearing, at times attentive, then uncaring. What languor when his lips were sealed, what fiery art his speech revealed, what casual letters he would send her. He lived, he breathed one single dream. How self-oblivious he could seem, how keen his glance, how bold and tender, and when he wished he'd make appear the quickly summoned glistening tear. How shrewdly he could be inventive and playfully astound the young, use flattery as warm incentive, or frighten with despairing tongue, and how he'd seize a moment's weakness to conquer youthful virtue's meekness through force of passion and of sense, and then await sweet recompense. At first he'd beg a declaration, and listen for the heart's first beat, then stalk love faster and entreat a lover's secret assignation, and then in private he'd prepare in silence to instruct the fair. How early he could stir or worry the hearts of even skilled coquettes, and when he found it necessary to crush a rival, oh, what nets, what clever traps he'd set before him, and how his wicked tongue would gore him. But you, you men in wedded bliss, you stayed his friends despite all this. The crafty husband fawned and chuckled, Forbless disciple and his tool, as did the sceptical old fool and the majestic antlered cuckold, so pleased with all he had in life, himself, his dinner, and his wife. Some mornings still abed he drowses until his valet brings his tray. What? Invitations? Yes, three houses have asked him to a grand soiree. There'll be a ball, a children's party. Where will he dash to, my good hearty? Where will he make the night's first call? No, oh, never mind. He'll make them all. But meanwhile... Dressed for morning pleasure, bedecked in broad-brimmed Bolivar, he drives to Nevsky Boulevard to stroll about at total leisure until Breguet's unsleeping chime reminds him that it's dinner time. He calls a sleigh as daylight's dimming. The cry resounds, Make way! Let's go! 
His collar, with its beaver trimming, is silver bright with frosted snow. He's off to Talons, late and racing, quite sure he'll find Caverin pacing. He enters, cork and bottle spout. The comet wine comes gushing out. A bloody roast beef's on the table, and truffles, youth's delight so keen, the very flower of French cuisine, and Strasbourg pie, that deathless fable, while next to Limburg's lively mould sits ananas in splendid gold. Another round would hardly hurt them to wash those sizzling cutlets down, but now the chime and watch alert them. The brand new ballet's on in town. He's off. This critic most exacting of all that touches art or acting, this fickle swain of every star and honoured patron of the bar, to join the crowd where each is ready to greet an entrechat with cheers or cleopatra with his jeers to hiss at phedre so unsteady recall moina and rejoice that every one has heard his voice enchanted land there for a season that friend of freedom ruled the scene the daring satirist von Wiesin, as did derivative knyazhnin there Ozerov received the nation's unbidden tears and its ovations, which young Semyonova did share, and our Katenin gave us there Corneille's full genius resurrected. And there the caustic Shakovskoy refreshed the stage with comic joy. Didlot, his crown of fame perfected, there too, beneath the theatre's tent, my fleeting youthful days were spent. My goddesses, you vanished faces, oh, hearken to my woeful call. Have other maidens gained your places, yet not replaced you, after all? Shall once again I hear your chants, or see the Russian muse of dance perform her soaring soulful flight? Or shall my mournful gaze alight on unknown faces on the stages? And when across this world I pass a disenchanted opera glass, shall I grow bored with mirth and rages, and shall I then in silence yawn and recollect a time that's gone? The theatre's full, the boxes glitter, the restless gallery claps and roars, the stalls and pit are all a jitter, the curtain rustles as it soars, and there, ethereal, resplendent, poised to the magic bow attendant, a throng of nymphs, her guardian band, Istomina takes up her stand. One foot upon the ground she places, and then the other slowly twirls, and now she leaps, and now she whirls, like down from Aeol's lips she races, then spins and twists and stops to beat her rapid, dazzling, dancing feet. As all applaud, Onegin enters, and treads on toes to reach his seat. His double glass he calmly centres on ladies he has yet to meet. He takes a single glance to measure these clothes and faces with displeasure, then, trading bows on every side with men he knew or friends he spied, he turned at last and vaguely fluttered his eyes toward the stage and play, then yawned and turned his head away. "'It's time for something new,' he muttered. "'I've suffered ballets long enough, "'but now Didlot is boring stuff. "'While all those cupids, devils, serpents "'upon the stage still romp and roar, "'and while the weary band of servants "'still sleeps on furs at carriage door, "'and while the people still are tapping, "'still sniffling, coughing, hissing, clapping, "'and while the lamps both in and out "'still glitter grandly all about, "'and while the horses, bored at tether, "'still fidget, freezing in the snow, "'and coachmen by the fire's glow, "'curse masters and beat palms together, Onegin now has left the scene, and driven home to change and preen. Shall I abandon every scruple and picture truly with my pen the room where fashion's model pupil is dressed, undressed, and dressed again? Whatever clever London offers to those with lavish whims and coffers, and ships to us by Baltic seas in trade for tallow and for trees, 
whatever Paris, seeking treasure, devises to attract the sight, or manufactures for delight, for luxury, for modish pleasure, all this adorned his dressing-room, our sage of eighteen summers' bloom. Imported pipes of Turkish amber, fine china, bronzes, all displayed, and purely to delight and pamper perfumes in crystal jars arrayed. Steel files and combs in many guises, straight scissors, curved ones, thirty sizes of brushes for the modern male, for hair and teeth and fingernail. Rousseau, permit me this digression, could not conceive how solemn Grimm dared clean his nails in front of him, the brilliant madcap of confession. In this case, though, one has to say that freedom's champion went astray for one may be a man of reason and mind the beauty of his nails. Why argue vainly with the season? For custom's rule a man prevails. Now my Eugene, Chadayev's double, from jealous critics fearing trouble, was quite the pedant in his dress, and what we called a fop, no less. At least three hours he peruses his figure in the looking-glass, then through his dressing-room he'll pass like flighty Venus when she chooses in man's attire to pay a call at masquerade or midnight ball. Your interest peaked and doubtless growing in current fashions of toilette, I might describe in terms more knowing his clothing for the learned set— this might well seem an indiscretion. Description, though, is my profession. But pantaloons, gilet, and frock, these words are hardly Russian stock, and I confess in public sorrow that, as it is, my diction groans with far too many foreign loans, but if indeed I overborrow, I have of old relied upon our academic lexicon." But let's abandon idle chatter and hasten rather to forestall our hero's headlong dashing clatter in hired coach towards the ball. Before the fronts of darkened houses, along a street that gently drowses, the double carriage lamps in rows pour forth their warm and cheerful glows, and on the snow make rainbows glitter. One splendid house is all alight, its countless lampions burning bright, while past its glassed-in windows flitter in quick succession silhouettes of ladies and their modish pets. But look, on Egin's at the gateway. He's past the porter, up the stair, through marble entry rushes straightway, then runs his fingers through his hair and steps inside. The crush increases, the droning music never ceases. A bold mazurka grips the crowd, the press intense, the hubbub loud. The guardsman clinks his spurs and dances, the charming ladies twirl their feet, enchanting creatures that entreat a hot pursuit of flaming glances, while, muffled by the violin, the wives their jealous gossip spin. In days of dreams and dissipations, on balls I madly used to dote. No surer place for declarations or for the passing of a note. And so I offer, worthy spouses, my services to save your houses. I pray you, heed my sound advice. You too, you mummers, I commend you to keep your daughters well in sight. Don't lower your lorgnettes at night, or else, or else may God defend you. All this I now can let you know, since I dropped sinning long ago. So much of life have I neglected in following where pleasure calls. Yet were not morals ill-affected, I even now would worship balls. I love youth's wanton, fevered madness, the crush, the glitter, and the gladness, the ladies' gowns so well designed. I love their feet, although you'll find that all of Russia scarcely numbers three pairs of shapely feet. And yet, how long it took me to forget two special feet. And in my slumbers they still assail a soul grown cold, and on my heart retain their hold. In what grim desert, madman banished, will you at last cut memory's thread? 
Ah, oh, dearest feet, where have you vanished? What vernal flowers do you tread? Brought up in oriental splendour, you left no prints, no pressings tender upon our mournful northern snow. You loved instead to come and go on yielding rugs in rich profusion, while I, so long ago it seems, for your sake smothered all my dreams of glory, country, proud seclusion, all gone are youth's bright years of grace, as from the meadow your light trace. Diana's breast is charming, brothers, and Flora's cheek, I quite agree, but I prefer above these others the foot of sweet terpsichore. It hints to probing ardent glances of rich rewards and peerless trances. Its token beauty stokes the fires, the willful swarm of hot desires. My dear Elvina, I adore it, beneath the table barely seen, in springtime on the meadows green, in winter with the hearth before it, upon the ballroom's mirrored floor, or perched on granite by the shore. I recollect the ocean rumbling. Oh, how I envied then the waves, those rushing tides in tumult tumbling, to fall about her feet like slaves. I longed to join the waves in pressing upon those feet these lips, caressing. No, never midst the fiercest blaze of wildest youth's most fervent days was I so racked with yearning's anguish. No maiden's lips were equal bliss, no rosy cheek that I might kiss, or sultry breast on which to languish. No, never once did passion's flood so rend my soul, so flame my blood. Another memory finds me ready, in cherished dreams I sometimes stand, and hold the lucky stirrup steady, then feel her foot within my hand. Once more imagination surges, once more that touch ignites and urges the blood within this withered heart, once more the love, once more the dart. But stop, enough. My babbling lyre has overpraised these haughty things. They're hardly worth the songs one sings, or all the passions they inspire. Their charming words and glances sweet are quite as faithless as their feet. But what of my Eugene? Half drowsing, he drives to bed from last night's ball, while Petersburg, already rousing, answers the drumbeat's duty call. The merchant's up. The peddler scurries, with jug in hand the milkmaid hurries, crackling the freshly fallen snow. The cabby plods to Hackney Row. In pleasant hubbub, morns are waking. The shutters open. Smoke ascends in pale blue shafts from chimney ends. The German baker's up and baking, and more than once in cotton cap has opened up his window trap. But, wearied by the ballroom's clamour, he... Sleeps in blissful, sheer delight, This child of comfort and of glamour, Who turns each morning into night. By afternoon he'll finally waken, The day ahead all planned and taken, The endless round, the varied game, Tomorrow, too, will be the same. But was he happy in the flower, The very springtime of his days, Amid his pleasures and their blaze, Amid his conquests of the hour, or was he profligate and hale amid his feasts to no avail? Yes, soon he lost all warmth of feeling. The social buzz became a bore, and all those beauties, once appealing, were objects of his thought no more. Inconstancy grew too fatiguing, and friends and friendship less intriguing, for after all, he couldn't drain an endless bottle of champagne to help those pies and beefsteaks settle, or go on dropping words of wit with throbbing head about to split. And so, for all his fiery metal, he did at last give up his love of pistol, sword and ready glove. We still, alas, cannot forestall it. This dreadful ailment's heavy toll, the spleen is what the English call it. We call it simply Russian soul. T'was this our hero had contracted. And though, thank God, he never acted to put a bullet through his head, his former love of life 
was dead. Like Byron's Harold, lost in trances, through drawing-rooms he'd pass and stare, but neither whist nor gossip there, nor wanton sighs, nor tender glances, no, nothing touched his sombre heart. He noticed nothing, took no part. Capricious bells of lofty station, you were the first that he forswore, for nowadays in our great nation the manner grand can only bore. I wouldn't say that ladies never discuss a say or Bentham ever, but generally you'll have to grant their talk's absurd if harmless cant, on top of which they're so unerring, so dignified, so awfully smart, so pious and so chaste of heart, so circumspect, so strict in bearing, so inaccessibly serene, mere sight of them brings on the spleen. You too, young mistresses of leisure, who late at night are whisked away in racing drushkies bound for pleasure along the Petersburg chaussee, he dropped you too in sudden fashion. Apostate from the storms of passion, he locked himself within his den, and, with a yawn, took up his pen and tried to write. But art's exaction of steady labour made him ill and nothing issued from his quill. So thus he failed to join the faction of writers, whom I won't condemn, since, after all, I'm one of them. Once more an idler, now he smothers the emptiness that plagues his soul by making his the thoughts of others. A laudable and worthy goal. He crammed his bookshelf, overflowing, then read and read, frustration growing, some raved or lied, and some were dense, some lacked all conscience, some all sense, each with a different dogma girded. The old was dated through and through, while nothing new was in the new. So books, like women, he deserted. And over all that dusty crowd he draped a linen mourning shroud. I, too, had parted with convention, with vain pursuit of worldly ends, and when Eugene drew my attention, I liked his ways, and we made friends. I liked his natural bent for dreaming, his strangeness that was more than seeming, the cold, sharp mind that he possessed. I was embittered, he depressed. With passion's game we both were sated, the fire in both our hearts was pale. Our lives were weary, flat and stale, and for us both ahead there waited, while life was still but in its morn, blind fortune's malice and men's scorn. He who has lived as thinking being within his soul must hold men small. He who can feel is always fleeing the ghost of days beyond recall. For him, enchantment's deep infection is gone. The snake of recollection and grim repentance gnaws his heart. All this, of course, can help impart great charm to private conversation, and though the language of my friend at first disturbed me, in the end I liked his caustic disputation, his blend of banter and of bile, his sombre wit and biting style. How often in the summer quarter, when midnight sky is limpid light above the neighbor's placid water, the river gay and sparkling bright, yet in its mirror not reflecting Diana's visage, recollecting the loves and intrigues of the past, alive once more and free at last, we drank in silent contemplation the balmy fragrance of the night. Like convicts sent in dreaming flight to forest green and liberation, so we, in fancy then, were born back to our springtime's golden morn. Filled with his heart's regrets, and leaning against the rampart's granite shelf, Eugene stood lost in pensive dreaming, as once some poet drew himself. The night grew still, with silence falling, only the sound of sentries calling, or suddenly, from Million Street, some distant droshkies rumbling beat, 
or floating on the drowsy river a lonely boat would sail along, while far away some rousing song or plaintive horn would make us shiver. But sweeter still, amid such nights, are Tasso's octave's soaring flights. Oh, Adriatic, grand creation, O oh, Brenta, I shall yet rejoice when, filled once more with inspiration, I hear at last your magic voice. It's sacred to Apollo's choir. Through Albion's great and haughty lyre, it speaks to me in words I know. On soft Italian nights I'll go in search of pleasure's sweet profusion. A fair Venetian at my side, now chatting, now a silent guide. I'll float in gondola's seclusion, and she... My willing lips will teach both love's and Petrarch's ardent speech. Will freedom come and cut my tether? It's time, it's time, I bid her hail. I roam the shore, await fair weather, and beckon to each passing sail. Oh, when, my soul, with waves contesting and caped in storms, shall I go questing upon the crossroads of the sea? It's time to quit this dreary lee and land of harsh, forbidding places, and there, where southern waves break high beneath my Africa's warm sky, to sigh for sombre Russia's spaces, where first I loved, where first I wept, and where my buried heart is kept. Eugene and I had both decided to make the foreign tour we'd planned, but all too soon our paths divided, for fate took matters into hand. His father died, quite unexpected, and round Eugene there soon collected the greedy horde demanding pay, each to his own, or so they say, Eugene, detesting litigation and quite contented with his fate, released to them the whole estate with no great sense of deprivation. Perhaps he also dimly knew his aged uncle's time was due. And sure enough, a note came flying. The bailiff wrote as if on cue. Onegin's uncle, sick and dying, would like to bid his heir adieu. He gave the message one quick reading, and then by post Eugene was speeding, already bored, to uncle's bed while thoughts of money filled his head. He was prepared, like any craven, to sigh, deceive, and play his part, with which my novel took its start. But when he reached his uncle's haven, a laid-out corpse was what he found, prepared as tribute for the ground. He found the manor fairly bustling with those who'd known the now deceased. Both friends and foes had come a-hustling, true lovers of a funeral feast. They laid to rest the dear departed, then, wined and dined and heavy-hearted, but pleased to have their duty done, the priests and guests left one by one. And here's Onegin, lord and master of woods and mills and streams and lands, a country squire. There he stands, that former wastrel and disaster. And rather glad he was, it's true, that he'd found something else to do. For two full days he was enchanted by lonely fields and burbling brook, by sylvan shade that lay implanted within a cool and leafy nook, but by the third he couldn't stick it. The grove, the hill, the field, the thicket, quite ceased to tempt him any more, and presently induced a snore. And then he saw that country byways, with no great palaces, no streets, no cards, no balls, no poets' feats, were just as dull as city highways, and spleen, he saw, would dog his life like shadow or a faithful wife. But I was born for peaceful roaming, for country calm and lack of strife. My lyre sings, and in the gloaming my fertile fancies spring to life. I give myself to harmless pleasures, and far niente rules my leisures. Each morning early I'm awake to wander by the lonely lake or seek some other sweet employment. I read a little, often sleep, for fleeting fame I do not weep. And was it not in past enjoyment of shaded idle times like this, 
I spent my days of deepest bliss. The country, love, green fields and flowers, sweet idleness, you have my heart. With what delight I praise those hours that set Eugene and me apart. For otherwise some mocking reader, or, God forbid, some wretched breeder of twisted slanders, might combine my hero's features here with mine, and then maintain the shameless fiction that, like proud Byron, I have penned a mere self-portrait in the end, as if today, through some restriction, we're now no longer fit to write on any theme but our own plight. All poets, I need hardly mention, have drawn from love abundant themes. I, too, have gazed in rapt attention when cherished beings filled my dreams. My soul preserved their secret features. The muse then made them living creatures. Just so, in carefree song, I paid my tribute to the mountain maid and sang the Salgia captive's praises. And now, my friends... I hear once more that question you have put before. For whom these sighs your lyre raises? To whom, amid the jealous throng, do you today devote your song? Whose gaze, evoking inspiration, rewards you with a soft caress? Whose form, in pensive adoration, do you now clothe in sacred dress? Why no one, friends, as God's my witness... For I have known too well the witless and maddened pangs of love's refrain. Oh, blessed is he who joins his pain to fevered rhyme, for thus he doubles the sacred ecstasy of art. Like Petrarch, then, he calms the heart, subduing passion's host of troubles, and captures worldly fame to boot. But I, in love, was dense and mute. The muse appeared as love was ending, and cleared the darkened mind she found. Once free, I seek again the blending of feeling, thought, and magic sound. I write, and want no more embraces. My straying pen no longer traces, beneath a verse left incomplete, the shapes of ladies' heads and feet. Extinguished ashes won't rekindle, and though I grieve, I weep no more. And soon... Quite soon, the tempest's core within my soul will fade and dwindle. And then I'll write this world a song that's five and twenty cantos long. I've drawn a plan and know what's needed. The hearer's named, the plotting's done, and meantime I've just now completed my present novel's chapter one. I've looked it over most severely, it has its contradictions, clearly, but I've no wish to change a line. I'll grant the censor's right to shine and send these fruits of inspiration to feed the critic's hungry pen. Fly to the neighbor's water, then, my spirit's own newborn creation, and earn me tribute paid to fame, distorted readings, noise and blame. Chapter Two O oh, Rus, Horace, O oh, Rus. The place Eugene found so confining was quite a lovely country nest, where one who favoured soft reclining would thank his stars to be so blessed. The manor house, in proud seclusion, screened by a hill from wind's intrusion, stood by a river. Far away, green meads and golden cornfields lay, lit by the sun as it paraded small hamlets too the eye could see, and cattle wandering o'er the lee, while near at hand, all dense and shaded, a vast neglected garden made a nook where pensive dryads played. The ancient manse had been erected for placid comfort, and to last and all its solid form reflected the sense and taste of ages past. Throughout the house the ceilings towered, from walls ancestral portraits glowered. The drawing-room had rich brocades and stoves of tile in many shades. 
All this today seems antiquated, I don't know why, but in the end it hardly mattered to my friend, for he had become so fully jaded he yawned alike where'er he sat, in ancient hall or modern flat. He settled where the former squire for forty years had heaved his sighs, had cursed the cook in useless ire, stared out the window and squashed flies. The furnishings were plain but stable, a couch, two cupboards and a table, no spot of ink on oaken floors. Onegin opened cupboard doors and found in one a list of wages, some fruit liqueurs and applejack, and in the next an almanac from 188 with tattered pages. The busy master never took a glance in any other book. Alone amid his new possessions, and merely as an idle scheme, Eugene devised a few concessions and introduced a new regime. A backwards genius, he commuted the old corvée and substituted a quitrant at a modest rate. His peasants thanked their lucky fate, but thrifty neighbours waxed indignant and in their dens bewailed as one the dreadful harm of what he'd done. Still others sneered or turned malignant, and everyone who chose to speak called him a menace and a freak. At first the neighbours' calls were steady, but when they learned that in the rear Onegin kept his stallion ready so that he could quickly disappear the moment one of them was sighted or heard approaching uninvited, they took offence, and, one and all, they dropped him cold and ceased to call. The man's a bore. He's off his rocker. Must be a mason. Drinks, they say. Red wine by tumbler, night and day. Won't kiss a lady's hand, the mocker. Won't call me sir the way he should. The general verdict wasn't good. Another squire chose this season to reappear at his estate and gave the neighbours equal reason for scrutiny no less irate. Vladimir Lensky, just returning from Göttingen with soulful yearning, was in his prime, a handsome youth and poet filled with Kantian truth. From misty Germany our squire had carried back the fruits of art, a freedom-loving, noble heart, a spirit strange but full of fire, an always bold, impassioned speech, and raven locks of shoulder reach. As yet unmarked by disillusion or chill corruption's deadly grasp, his soul still knew the warm effusion of maiden's touch and friendship's clasp. A charming fool at love's vocation, he fed on hope's eternal ration. The world's fresh glitter and its call still held his youthful mind in thrall. He entertained with fond illusions the doubts that plagued his heart and will. The goal of life, he found, was still a tempting riddle of confusions. He racked his brains and rather thought that miracles could still be wrought. He knew a kindred soul was fated to join her life to his career, that even now she pined and waited, expecting he would soon appear, and he believed that men would tender their freedom for his honour's splendour, that friendly hands would surely rise to shatter slander's cup of lies, that there exists a holy cluster of chosen ones whom men should heed, a happy and immortal breed, whose potent light in all its lustre would one day shine upon our race and grant the world redeeming grace. Compassion, noble indignation, a perfect love of righteous ways, and fame's delicious agitation had stirred his soul since early days, he roamed the world with singing lyre and found the source of lyric fire beneath the skies of distant lands, from Goethe's and from Schiller's hands. He never shamed the happy creature, the lofty muses of his art. He proudly sang with open heart, sublime emotions every feature, the charm of gravely simple things and youthful hopes on youthful wings. He sang of love. 
My love commanded a simple and affecting tune, as clear as maiden thoughts, as candid as infant slumber, as the moon in heaven's peaceful desert flying, that queen of secrets and of sighing. He sang of parting and of pain, of something vague, of mists and rain. He sang the rose, romantic flower, and distant lands where once he'd shared his living tears upon the bed of silence at a lonely hour. He sang life's bloom gone pale and sear. He had almost reached his eighteenth year. Throughout that barren, dim dominion, Eugene alone could see his worth and Lenski formed a low opinion of neighbours' feasts and rounds of mirth. He fled their noisy congregations and found their solemn conversations of liquor and of hay brought in, of kennels and of distant kin, devoid of any spark of feeling or hint of inner lyric grace. Both wit and brains were out of place, as were the arts of social dealing. But then their charming wives, he found, at talk were even less profound. Well off and handsome in addition, young Lenski seemed the perfect catch. And so, by countryside tradition, they asked him round and sought to match their daughters with this semi-Russian. He'd call, and right away discussion would touch obliquely on the point that bachelors' lives were out of joint, and then the guest would be invited to take some tea while Dunya poured. They whisper, Dunya, don't look bored. Then bring in her guitar, excited, and then, good God, she'd start to bawl. Come to my golden chamber hall. But Lenski, having no desire for marriage bonds or wedding bell, had cordial hopes that he'd acquire the chance to know Onegin well. And so they met, like wave with mountain, like verse with prose, like flame with fountain, their natures distant and apart. At first their differences of heart made meetings dull at one another's, but then their friendship grew, and soon they'd meet on horse each afternoon, and in the end were close as brothers. Thus people, so it seems to me, become good friends from sheer ennui. But even friendships like our heroes exist no more, for we've outgrown all sentiments and deem men zeros, except, of course, ourselves alone. We all take on Napoleon's features, and millions of our fellow creatures are nothing more to us than tools, since feelings are for freaks and fools. Eugene, of course, had keen perceptions and, on the whole, despised mankind, yet wasn't, like so many, blind. And since each rule permits exceptions, he did respect a noble few, and, cold himself, gave warmth its due. He smiled at Lenski's conversation, indeed the poet's fervent speech, his gaze of constant inspiration, his mind still vacillant in reach. All these were new and unexpected, and so, for once, Eugene elected to keep his wicked tongue in check and thought, what foolishness to wreck the young man's blissful, brief infection. Its time will pass without my knife, so let him, meanwhile, live his life believing in the world's perfection. Let's grant to fevered youthful days their youthful ravings and their blaze. The two found everything a basis for argument or food for thought, the covenants of bygone races, the fruits that learned science brought, the prejudice that haunts all history, the grave's eternal fateful mystery, and good and evil, life and fate, on each in turn they'd ruminate. The poet, lost in hot contention, would oft recite his eyes ablaze, brief passages from Nordic lays, Eugene, with friendly condescension, would listen with a look intense, although he seldom saw their sense. More often, though, my two recluses would muse on passions and their flights. Eugene, who'd fled their wild abuses, regretted still his past delights and sighed, recalling their interment. Oh, happy he who's known the ferment of passions and escaped their lot! 
More happy he who knew them not, who cooled off love with separation and enmity with harsh contempt, who yawned with wife and friends, exempt from pangs of jealous agitation, who never risked his sound estate upon a deuce, that cunning bait. When we at last turn into sages and flock to tranquil wisdom's crest, when passion's flame no longer rages and all the yearnings in our breast, the wayward fits, the final surges, have all become mere comic urges and pain has made us humble men, we sometimes like to listen then as others tell of passion's swelling. They stir our hearts and fan the flame, just so a soldier, old and lame, forgotten in his wretched dwelling, will strain to hear with bated breath the young blood's yarns of courting death. But flaming youth in all its madness keeps nothing of its heart concealed. Its loves and hates, its joy and sadness are babbled out and soon revealed. Onegin, who was widely taken as one whom love had left forsaken, would listen gravely to the end when self-expression gripped his friend. The poet, feasting on confession, naively poured his secrets out. And so Eugene learned all about the course of youthful love's progression, a story rich in feelings, too, although to us they're hardly new. Ah, yes, he loved in such a fashion as men today no longer do, as only poets, mad with passion, still love, because they're fated to. He knew one constant source of dreaming, one constant wish forever gleaming, one ever-present cause for pain, and neither distance nor the chain of endless years of separation, nor pleasure's rounds, nor learning's well, nor foreign beauty's magic spell, nor yet the muse, his true vocation, could alter Lenski's deep desire, his soul aflame with virgin fire. When scarce a boy, and not yet knowing the torment of a heart in flames, he'd been entranced by Olga growing, and fondly watched her girlhood games. Beneath a shady park's protection, he chaired her frolics with affection. Their fathers, who were friends, had plans to read one day their marriage bands, and deep within her rustic bower, beneath her parents' loving gaze, she blossomed in a maiden's ways, a valley lily come to flower, off where the grass grows dense and high, unseen by bee or butterfly. She gave the poet intimations of youthful ecstasies unknown, and filling all his meditations, drew forth his flute's first ardent moan. Farewell, O oh golden game's illusion, he fell in love with dark seclusion, with stillness, stars, the lonely night, and with the moon's celestial light, that lamp to which we've consecrated a thousand walks in evening's calm and countless tears, the gentle balm of secret torments unabated, Today, though all we see in her is just another lantern's blur. Forever modest, meek in bearing, as gay as morning's rosy dress, like any poet, open, caring, as sweet as love's own soft caress, her sky-blue eyes, devoid of guile, her flaxen curls, her lovely smile, her voice, her form, her graceful stance, oh, Olga's every trait, but glance in any novel, you'll discover her portrait there. It's charming, true. I liked it once no less than you. But round it, boredom seems to hover. And so, dear reader, grant me pause to plead her elder sister's cause. Her sister bore the name Tatiana. And we now press our willful claim to be the first who thus shall honour a tender novel with that name. Why not? I like its intonation. It has, I know, association with olden days beyond recall, with humble roots and servants' hall. But we must grant, though it offend us, our taste in names is less than weak. Of verses I won't even speak. Enlightenment has failed to mend us, and all we've learned from its great store is affectation, nothing more. 
So she was called Tatiana, reader. She lacked that fresh and rosy tone that made her sister's beauty sweeter and drew all eyes to her alone. A wild creature, sad and pensive, shy as a doe and apprehensive, Tatiana seemed among her kin a stranger who had wandered in. She never learned to show affection, to hug her parents, either one. A child herself, for children's fun, she lacked the slightest predilection, and oftentimes she'd sit all day in silence at the window bay. But pensiveness, her friend and treasure through all her years since cradle days, adorned the course of rural leisure by bringing dreams before her gaze. She never touched a fragile finger to thread a needle, wouldn't linger above a tambour to enrich a linen cloth with silk and stitch. Mark how the world compels submission. The little girl with docile doll prepares in play for protocol, for every social admonition, and to her doll, without demur, repeats what Mamma taught to her. But dolls were never Tanya's passion. When she was small, she didn't choose to talk to them of clothes or fashion or tell them all the city news. And she was not the sort who glories in girlish pranks, but grisly stories quite charmed her heart when they were told on winter nights all dark and cold. Whenever Nanny brought together young Olga's friends to spend the day, Tatiana never joined their play or games of tag upon the heather for she was bored by all their noise, their laughing shouts and giddy joys. Upon her balcony appearing, she loved to greet Aurora's show, when dancing stars are disappearing against the heaven's pallid glow, when earth's horizon softly blushes, and wind, the morning's herald, rushes, and slowly day begins its flight. In winter, when the shade of night still longer half the globe encumbers, and neath the misty moon on high an idle stillness rules the sky, and late the lazy east still slumbers, awakened early nonetheless, by candlelight she'd rise and dress. From early youth she read romances, and novels set her heart aglow. She loved the fictions and the fancies of Richardson and of Rousseau, her father was a kindly fellow, lost in a past he found more mellow, but still in books he saw no harm, and though immune to reading's charm, deemed it a minor peccadillo, nor did he care what secret tome his daughter read or kept at home asleep till morn beneath her pillow. His wife herself, we ought to add, for Richardson was simply mad. It wasn't that she'd read him, really, nor was it that she much preferred to Lovelace Grandison, but merely that long ago she'd often heard her Moscow cousin, Princess Laura, go on about their special aura. Her husband at the time was still her fiancé, against her will, for she, in spite of family feeling, had someone else for whom she pined, a man whose heart and soul and mind she found a great deal more appealing. This Grandison was fashion's pet, a gambler and a guard's cadet. About her clothes one couldn't fault her. Like him, she dressed as taste decreed. But then they led her to the altar and never asked if she agreed. The clever husband chose correctly to take his grieving bride directly to his estate, where first she cried, with God knows whom on every side, then tossed about and seemed demented, and almost even left her spouse. But then she took to keeping house and settled down and grew contented. Thus heaven's gift to us is this, that habit takes the place of bliss. "'Twas only habit, then, that taught her the way to master rampant grief, and soon a great discovery brought her a final and complete relief. But twixt her chores and idle hours she learned to use her woman's powers to rule the house as autocrat, and life went smoothly after that. She'd drive around to check the workers. She pickled mushrooms for the fall. She made her weekly bathhouse call. She kept the books. She shaved the shirkers. She beat the maids when she was cross, and left her husband at a loss. 
She used to write with blood quotations in maidens' albums, thought it keen to speak in sing-song intonations, would call Praskovia Cher Pauline. She laced her corset very tightly, pronounced a Russian N as slightly as un in French and through the nose. But soon she dropped her city pose, the corsets, albums, chic relations. The sentimental verses, too, were quite forgot. She bid adieu to all her foreign affectations and took at last to coming down in just her cap and quilted gown. And yet her husband loved her dearly. In all her schemes he'd never probe. He trusted all she did sincerely and ate and drank in just his robe. His life flowed on quite calm and pleasant, with kindly neighbours sometimes present, for hearty talk at even fall, just casual friends who'd often call to shake their heads, to prate and prattle, to laugh a bit at something new, and time would pass, till Olgard brew some tea to wet their tittle-tattle, then supper came, then time for bed, and off the guests would drive, well fed. Amid this peaceful life they cherished, they held all ancient customs dear. At Shrovetide feasts their table flourished with Russian pancakes, Russian cheer. Twice yearly, too, they did their fasting, were fond of songs for fortune-casting, of choral dances, garden swings. At Trinity, when service brings the people yawning in for prayer, they'd shed a tender tear or two upon their buttercups of rue. They needed kvass no less than air, and at their table guests were served by rank, in turn, as each deserved. And thus they aged, as do all mortals, until at last the husband found that death had opened wide its portals, through which he entered newly crowned. He died at midday's break from labour, lamented much by friend and neighbour, by children and by faithful wife, far more than some who part this life. He was a kind and simple barin. And there, where now his ashes lie, a tombstone tells the passer-by, the humble sinner Dmitri Larin, a slave of God and brigadier, beneath this stone now resteth here. Restored to home and its safe-keeping, young Lenski came to cast an eye upon his neighbour's place of sleeping, and mourned his ashes with a sigh. And long he stood in sorrow aching. Poor Yorick, then he murmured, shaking, how oft within his arms I lay, how oft in childhood days I'd play with his Ochakov decoration. He destined Olga for my wife, and used to say, Oh, grant me life to see the day. In lamentation, right then and there, Vladimir penned a funeral verse for his old friend. And then, with verse of quickened sadness, he honoured too, in tears and pain, his parents' dust, their memory's gladness. Alas, upon life's furrowed plain, a harvest brief, each generation, by fate's mysterious dispensation, arises, ripens, and must fall. Then others, too, must heed the call, for thus our giddy race gains power. It waxes, stirs, turns seething wave, then crowds its forebears toward the grave. And we as well shall face that hour, when one fine day our grandsons true straight out of life will crowd us too. So, meanwhile, friends, enjoy your blessing, this fragile life that hurries so. Its worthlessness needs no professing, and I'm not loath to let it go. I've closed my eyes to phantoms gleaming, yet distant hopes within me dreaming still stir my heart at times to flight. I'd grieve to quit this world's dim light and leave no trace, however slender. I live, I write, not seeking fame, and yet I think... I'd wish to claim for my sad lot its share of splendour, at least one note to linger long, recalling, like some friend, my song. And it may touch some heart with fire, and thus preserved by fate's decree, the stanza fashioned by my lyre may yet not drown in Lethe's sea, 
perhaps, a flattering hope's illusion, some future dunce with warm effusion will point my portrait out and plead, this was a poet, yes indeed. Accept my thanks and admiration, you lover of the muse's art. O oh, you whose mind shall know by heart the fleeting works of my creation, whose cordial hand shall then be led to pat the old man's laurelled head. Chapter 3 Elle était fille, elle était amoureuse. Malfilatre Ah, me, these poets, such a hurry. Goodbye, Onegin, time I went. Well, I won't keep you, have no worry, but where are all your evenings spent? The Larin place. What reckless daring, good God, man, don't you find it wearing, just killing time that way each night? Why, not at all. Well, serves you right. I've got the scene in mind so clearly. For starters, tell me if I'm wrong. A simple Russian family throng. The guests all treated so sincerely, with lots of jam and talk to spare, on rain and flax and cattle care. Well, where's the harm? The evening passes. The boredom, brother, there's the harm. Well, I despise your upper classes and like the family circle's charm. It's where I find more pastoral singing. Enough, old boy. My ears are ringing. And so you're off. Forgive me, then. But tell me, Lensky, how and when I'll see this Phyllis so provoking who haunts your thoughts and writer's quill, your tears and rhymes and what you will. Present me. Do. You must be joking. I'm not. Well, then, why not tonight? They'll welcome us with great delight. Let's go. And so the friends departed, and on arrival duly meet that sometimes heavy but good-hearted old-fashioned Russian welcome treat. The social ritual never changes. The hostess artfully arranges on little dishes her preserves, and on her covered table serves a drink of lingonberry flavour. With folded arms, along the hall, the maids have gathered one and all to glimpse the larin's brand-new neighbour, while in the yard their men reproach Onegin's taste in horse and coach. Now home's our hero's destination, as down the shortest road they fly. Let's listen to their conversation and use a furtive ear to spy. Why all these yawns, Onegin? Really? Mere habit, Lensky. But you're clearly more bored than usual. No, the same. The fields are dark now. What a shame. Come on, Andriushka, faster, matey. Oh, these stupid woods and fields and streams. Oh, by the way, Dame Larin seems a symbol, but a nice old lady. I fear that Lingonberry brew may do me in before it's through. But tell me, which one was Tatiana? Why, she who with a wistful air, all sad and silent like Svetlana, came in and took the window chair. And really you prefer the other? Why not? Were I the poet, brother, I'd choose the elder one instead. Your Olga's look is cold and dead, as in some dull Van Dyke Madonna, so round and fair of face is she. She's like that stupid moon, you see, up in that stupid sky you honour. Vladimir gave a curt reply and let the conversation die. Meanwhile... On Egan's presentation at Madame Larin's country seat produced at large a great sensation and gave the neighbours quite a treat. They all began to gossip slyly, to joke and comment, rather wryly, and soon the general verdict ran that Tanyard finally found a man. Some even knowingly conceded that wedding plans had long been set, and then postponed till they could get the stylish rings the couple needed. As far as Lensky's wedding stood, they knew they'd settled that for good. Tatiana listened with vexation to all this gossip, but it's true that with a secret exultation, despite herself, she wondered too— 
and in her heart the thought was planted, until at last her fate was granted. She fell in love. For thus indeed does spring awake the buried seed. Long since her keen imagination, with tenderness and pain imbued, had hungered for the fatal food. Long since her heart's sweet agitation had choked her maiden breast too much, her soul awaited someone's touch. And now, at last, the wait has ended. Her eyes have opened, seen his face. And now, alas, she lives attended, all day, all night, in sleep's embrace, by dreams of him. Each passing hour, the world itself, with magic power, but speaks of him. She cannot bear the way the watchful servants stare or stand the sound of friendly chatter. Immersed in gloom beyond recall, she pays no heed to guests at all and damns their idle ways and patter, their tendency to just drop in and talk all day once they begin. And now, with what great concentration to tender novels she retreats, with what a vivid fascination takes in their ravishing deceits. Those figures fancy has created, her happy dreams have animated. The lover of Julie Volmar, Malek Adhel, and Delinar, and Werther, that rebellious martyr, and Grandison, the noble lord, with whom today we're rather bored, all these... Our dreamy maiden's ardour has pictured with a single grace and seen in all Onegin's face. And then her warm imagination perceives herself as heroine, some favourite author's fond creation, Clarissa, Julia or Delphine. She wanders with her borrowed lovers through silent woods and so discovers within a book her heart's extremes, her secret passions and her dreams. She sighs, and in her soul possessing another's joy, another's pain, she whispers in a soft refrain the letter she would send caressing her hero, who was none the less no Grandison in Russian dress. Time was, with grave and measured diction, a fervent author used to show the hero in his work of fiction endowed with bright perfection's glow. He'd furnish his beloved child, forever hounded and reviled, with tender soul and manly grace, intelligence and handsome face. And nursing noble passion's rages, the ever dauntless hero stood, prepared to die for love of good and in the novel's final pages, deceitful vice was made to pay, and honest virtue won the day. But now our minds have grown inactive. We're put to sleep by talk of sin. Our novels, too, make vice attractive, and even there it seems to win. It's now the British muses' fables that lie on maidens' bedside tables and haunt their dreams. They worship now the vampire with his pensive brow, or gloomy Melmoth, lost and pleading, the corsair, or the wandering Jew, and enigmatics Bogar, too. Lord Byron, his caprice succeeding, cloaked even hopeless egotism in saturnine romanticism. But what's the point? I'd like to know it. Perhaps, my friends, by fate's decree, I'll cease one day to be a poet when some new demon seizes me, and scorning then Apollo's ire, to humble prose I'll bend my lyre. A novel in the older vein will claim what happy days remain. No secret crimes or passions gory shall I in grim detail portray, but simply tell, as best I may, a Russian family's age-old story, a tale of lovers and their lot, of ancient customs unforgot. I'll give a father's simple greetings and aged uncles in my book, I'll show the children secret meetings by ancient lindens near the brook, their jealous torments, separation, their tears of reconciliation. I'll make them quarrel yet again, but lead them to the altar then. 
I'll think up speeches, tender-hearted, recall the words of passion's heat, those words with which, before the feet of some fair mistress long departed, my heart and tongue once used to soar, but which to-day I use no more. Tatiana, oh, my dear Tatiana, I shed with you sweet tears too late. Relying on a tyrant's honour, you've now resigned to him your fate. My dear one, you are doomed to perish. But first, in dazzling hope, you nourish and summon forth a sombre bliss. You learn life's sweetness, feel its kiss, and drink the draught of love's temptations as phantom daydreams haunt your mind. On every side you seem to find retreats for happy assignations, while everywhere before your eyes your fateful tempter's figure lies. The ache of love pursues Tatiana. She takes a garden path and sighs. A sudden faintness comes upon her. She can't go on. She shuts her eyes. Her bosom heaves, her cheeks are burning, scarce breathing lips grow still with yearning. Her ears resound with ringing cries, and sparkles dance before her eyes. Night falls, the moon begins parading the distant vault of heaven's hood. The nightingale in darkest wood breaks out in mournful serenading. Tatiana tosses through the night and wakes her nurse to share her plight. I couldn't sleep. Oh, nurse, it's stifling. Put up the window. Sit by me. What ails you, Tanya? Life's so trifling. Come, tell me how it used to be. Well, what about it? Lord, it's ages. I must have known a thousand pages of ancient facts and fables, too, about evil ghosts and girls like you. But nowadays I'm not so canny. I can't remember much of late. Oh, Tanya, it's a sorry state. I get confused. But tell me, Nanny, about the olden days. You know, were you in love then, long ago? Oh, come, our world was quite another. We'd never heard of love, you see. Why, my good husband's sainted mother would just have been the death of me. Then how do you come to marry, Nanny? The will of God, I guess. My Danny was younger still than me, my dear, uh, and I was just thirteen that year. The marriage-maker kept on calling for two whole weeks to see my kin, till father blessed me and gave in. I got so scared, my tears kept falling, and weeping they undid my plait, then sang me to the churchyard gate. And so they took me off to strangers. But you're not even listening, Pat. Oh, Nanny... Life so full of dangers, I'm sick at heart and all upset. I'm on the verge of tears and wailing. My goodness, girl, you must be ailing. Dear Lord, have mercy. God, I plead. Just tell me, dearest, what you need. I'll sprinkle you with holy water. You're burning up. Oh, do be still. I'm... You know, nurse, in love, not ill. The Lord be with you now, my daughter. And with her wrinkled hand, the nurse then crossed the girl and mumbled verse. Oh, I'm in love, again she pleaded with her old friend. My little dove, you're just not well, you're overheated. Oh, let me be now, I'm in love. And all the while the moon was shining, and with its murky light defining Tatiana's charms and pallid air, her long, unloosened braids of hair and drops of tears, while on a hassock beside the tender maiden's bed, a kerchief on her grizzled head, sat Nanny in her quilted cassock, and all the world in silence lay beneath the moon's seductive ray. Far off, Tatiana ranged in dreaming, bewitched by moonlight's magic curse. And then a sudden thought came gleaming. I'd be alone now. Leave me, nurse. But give me first a pen and paper. I, I won't be long. Just leave the taper. Good night. She's now alone, all still. The moonlight shines upon her sill, and, propped upon an elbow writing, Tatiana pictures her Eugene, 
and in a letter rash and green pours forth the maiden's blameless plighting, the letters ready, all but sent. For whom, Tatiana, is it meant? I've known great beauties proudly distant, as cold and chaste as winter snow, implacable to all resistant, impossible for mind to know. I've marvelled at their haughty manner, their natural virtue's flaunted banner, and, I confess, from them I fled, as if in terror I had read above their brows the sign of Hades, abandon hope who enter here. Their joy is striking men with fear, for love offends these charming ladies. Perhaps along the neighbour's shore you too have known such bells before. Why, I've seen ladies so complacent before their loyal subjects gaze that they would even grow impatient with sighs of passion and with praise. But what did I, amazed, discover? On scaring off some timid lover with stern behaviour's grim attack, these creatures then would lure him back, by joining him at least in grieving, by seeming, in their words at least, more tender to the wounded beast, and blind as ever, still believing, the youthful lover with his yen would chase sweet vanity again. So why is Tanya, then, more tainted? Is it because her simple heart believes the chosen dream she's painted and in deceit will take no part? Because she heeds the call of passion in such an honest, artless fashion? Because she's trusting more than proud and by the heavens was endowed with such a rashness in surrender, with such a lively mind and will, and with a spirit never still, and with a heart that's warm and tender. But can't you, friends, forgive her, pray, the giddiness of passion's sway? The flirt will always reason coldly. Tatiana's love is deep and true. She yields without conditions, boldly as sweet and trusting children do. She does not say, let's wait till later to make love's value all the greater and bind him tighter with our rope. Let's prick vainglory first with hope and then with doubt in fullest measure we'll whip his heart and when it's tame, revive it with a jealous flame. For otherwise, grown bored with pleasure, the cunning captive any day might break his chains and slip away. I face another complication. My country's honour will demand, without a doubt, a full translation of Tanya's letter from my hand. She knew the Russian language badly, ignored our journals all too gladly, and in her native tongue, I fear, could barely make her meaning clear. And so she turned for love's discussion to French. There's nothing I can do. A lady's love, I say to you, has never been expressed in Russian. Our mighty tongue, God only knows, has still not mastered postal prose. Some would that ladies be required to read in Russian. Dread command! Why, I can picture them, inspired, the good Samaritan in hand. I ask you now to tell me truly, you poets who have sinned unduly, have not those creatures you adore, those objects of your verse, and more, been weak at Russian conversation? And have they not, the charming fools, distorted sweetly all the rules of usage and pronunciation, while yet a foreign language slips with native glibness from their lips? God spare me from the apparition on leaving some delightful ball of bonneted academician or scholar in a yellow shawl. I find a faultless Russian style like crimson lips without a smile. Mistakes in grammar charm the mind. Perhaps, if fate should prove unkind, this generation's younger beauties, responding to our journal's call, with grammar may delight us all, and verses will be common duties. But what care I for all they do? To former ways I'll still be true. A careless drawl, a tiny stutter, 
Some imprecision of the tongue can still produce a lovely flutter within this breast no longer young. I lack the strength for true repentance, and gallicisms in a sentence seem sweet as youthful sins remote, or verse that Bogdanovich wrote. But that will do. My beauty's letter must occupy my pen for now. I gave my word, but, Lord, I vow retracting it would suit me better. I know the gentle Parnes lays are out of fashion nowadays. Bard of the feasts and languid sorrow, if you were with me still, my friend, immodestly I'd seek to borrow your genius for a worthy end. I'd have you with your art refashion a maiden's foreign words of passion and make them magic songs anew. Where are you? Come, I bow to you and yield my rights to love's translation. But there beneath the Finnish sky, amid those mournful crags on high, his heart grown deaf to commendation, alone upon his way he goes, and does not heed my present woes. Tatiana's letter lies beside me, and reverently I guard it still. I read it with an ache inside me, and cannot ever read my fill. Who taught her then this soft surrender, this careless gift for waxing tender, this touching whimsy free of art, this raving discourse of the heart, enchanting yet so fraught with trouble? I'll never know. But none the less, I give it here in feeble dress a living picture's pallid double, or freischutz played with timid skill by fingers that are learning still. Tatiana's Letter to Onegin I'm writing you this declaration. What more can I in candour say? It may be now your inclination to scorn me and to turn away. But if my hapless situation evokes some pity for my woe, you won't abandon me, I know. I first tried silence and evasion. Believe me, you'd have never learned my secret shame had I discerned the slightest hope that on occasion, but once a week I'd see your face, behold you at our country place, might hear you speak a friendly greeting, could say a word to you, and then could dream both day and night again of but one thing till our next meeting. They say you like to be alone and find the country unappealing. We lack, I know, a worldly tone, but still we welcome you with feeling. Why did you ever come to call in this forgotten country dwelling? I'd not have known you then at all, nor known this bitter heartache swelling. Perhaps when time had helped in quelling the girlish hopes on which I fed, I might have found, who knows, another, and been a faithful wife and mother, contented with the life I led. Another? No. In all creation, there's no one else who might adore. The heavens chose my destination and made me thine for evermore. My life till now has been a token in pledge of meeting you, my friend, and in your coming God has spoken. You'll be my guardian till the end. You filled my dreams and sweetest trances as yet unseen and yet so dear. You stirred me with your wondrous glances, your voice within my soul rang clear, and then the dream came true for me. When you came in, I seemed to waken, I turned to flame, I felt all shaken, and in my heart I cried, It's he! And was it you I heard replying amid the stillness of the night, or when I helped the poor and dying, or turned to heaven, softly crying, and said a prayer to soothe my plight? And even now, my dearest vision, did I not see your apparition flit softly through this loosened night? Was it not you who seemed to hover above my bed, a gentle lover, to whisper hope and sweet delight? Are you my angel of salvation, or hell's own demon of temptation. Be kind, 
and send my doubts away, for this may all be mere illusion, the things a simple girl would say, while fate intends no grand conclusion. So be it then. Henceforth I place my faith in you and your affection. I plead with tears upon my face and beg you for your kind protection. You cannot know. I am so alone. There's no one here to whom I've spoken. My mind and will are almost broken, and I must die without a moan. I wait for you, and your decision. Revive my hopes with but a sign, or halt this heavy dream of mine, alas, with well-deserved derision. I close. I dare not now reread. I shrink with shame and fear. But surely your honour's all the pledge I need, and I submit to it securely. The letter trembles in her fingers. By turns Tatiana groans and sighs. The rosy ceiling wafer lingers upon her fevered tongue and dries. Her head is bowed as if she's dozing. Her light chemise has slipped, exposing her lovely shoulder to the night. But now the moonbeam's glowing light begins to fade. The veil emerges above the mist. And now the stream in silver curves begins to gleam. The shepherd's pipe resounds and urges the villager to rise. It's morn. My Tanya, though, is so forlorn. She takes no note of dawn's procession, just sits with lowered head remote, nor does she put her seal's impression upon the letter that she wrote. But now her door is softly swinging, it's grey Filatyevna, who's bringing her morning tea upon a tray. It's time, my sweet, to greet the day. Why, pretty one, you're up already. You're still my little early bird. Last night you scared me, upon my word, but thank the Lord you seem more steady. No trace at all of last night's fret. Your cheeks are poppies now, my pet. Oh, nurse, a favour, please, and hurry. Why, sweetheart, anything you choose. You mustn't think, and please don't worry, but see, oh, nanny, don't refuse. As God's my witness, dear, I promise. Then send your grandson, little Thomas, to take this note of mine to... Our neighbour nurse, the one you know, and tell him that he's not to mention my name or breathe a single word. But who's it for, my little bird? I'm trying hard to pay attention, but we have lots of neighbours call. I couldn't even count them all. Oh, nurse, your wits are all befuddled. But, sweetheart, I've grown old. I mean, I'm old. My mind, it does get muddled. There was a time when I was keen, when just the master's least suggestion. Oh, Nanny, please, that's not the question. It's not your mind I'm talking of. I'm thinking of Onegin, love. This note's to him. Now don't get riled. You know these days I'm not so clear. I'll take the letter, never fear. But you've gone pale again, my child. It's nothing, Nanny. Be at ease. Just send your grandson, will you please? The day wore on. No word came flying. Another fruitless day went by. All dressed since dawn, dead pale and sighing, Tatiana waits. Will he reply? Then Olga's suitor came a-wooing. But tell me, what's your friend been doing? asked Tanya's mother, full of cheer. He's quite forgotten us, I fear. Tatiana blushed and trembled gently. He promised he would come today, said Lensky in his friendly way. The mail has kept him, evidently. Tatiana bowed her head in shame, as if they all thought her to blame. Twas dusk, and on the table, gleaming, the evening samovar grew hot. It hissed and sent its vapour steaming in swirls about the china pot. And soon the fragrant tea was flowing as Olga poured it, dark and glowing, in all the cups. Without a sound, a serving boy took cream around. Tatiana by the window lingers. 
and breathes upon the chilly glass. All lost in thought, the gentle lass begins to trace with lovely fingers across the misted panes a row of hallowed letters, E and O. And all the while her soul was aching, her brimming eyes could hardly see. Then sudden hoofbeats. Now she's quaking. They're closer, coming here. It's he, Onegin. Oh, and light as air, she's out the back way, down the stair, from porch to yard to garden straight. She runs, she flies, she dare not wait to glance behind her. On she pushes, past garden plots, small bridges, lawn, the lakeway path, the wood, and on she flies and breaks through lilac bushes, past seabeds to the brook so fast that, panting on a bench at last, she falls. He's here, but all those faces, oh God, what must he think of me? that still her anguished heart embraces a misty dream of what might be. She trembles, burns, and waits so near him. But will he come? She doesn't hear him. Some surf girls in the orchard there, while picking berries, filled the air with choral song, as they'd been bidden. An edict that was meant, you see, to keep sly mouths from feeling free to eat the master's fruit when hidden, by filling them with song instead, for rural cunning isn't dead. The girl's song. Lovely maidens, pretty ones, dearest hearts and darling friends, romp away, sweet lasses, now, have your fling, my dear ones, do, strike you up a rousing song, sing our secret ditty now, lure some likely lusty lad to the circle of our dance, when we lure the fellow on, when we see him from afar, darlings, then let's scamper off, Pelting him with cherries, then. Cherries, yes, and raspberries. Ripe red currants let us throw. Never come to listen in when we sing our secret songs. Never come to spy on us when we play our maiden games. Tatiana listens, scarcely hearing the vibrant voices, sits apart and waits impatient in her clearing to calm the tremor in her heart and halt the constant surge of blushes. But still her heart in panic rushes, her cheeks retain their blazing glow and ever brighter, brighter grow. Just so a butterfly both quivers and beats an iridescent wing when captured by some boy in spring. Just so a hare in winter shivers when suddenly far off it sees the hunter hiding in the trees. But finally she rose, forsaken, and sighing started home for bed. But hardly had she turned and taken the garden lane when straight ahead, his eyes ablaze, Eugene stood waiting, like some grim shade of night's creating, and she, as if by fire seared, drew back and stopped when he appeared. Just now, though, friends, I feel too tired to tell you how this meeting went and what ensued from that event. I've talked so long that I've required a little walk, some rest and play. I'll finish up another day. Chapter 4 La morale est dans la nature des choses. Necker The less we love her when we woo her, the more we draw a woman in and thus more surely we undo her within the witching webs we spin. Time was when cold debauch was lauded as love's high art, and was applauded for trumpeting its happy lot in taking joy while loving not. But that pretentious game is dated, but fit for apes who once held sway amid our forebears' vaunted day. The fame of lovelaces has faded, along with fashions long since dead, majestic wigs and heels of red. Who doesn't find dissembling dreary, 
or trying gravely to convince, recasting platitudes till weary, when all agree and have long since. How dull to hear the same objections to overcome those predilections that no young girl thirteen, I vow, has ever had and hasn't now. Who wouldn't grow fatigued with rages, entreaties, vows, pretended fears, betrayals, gossip, rings and tears, with notes that run to seven pages, with watchful mothers, aunts who stare, and friendly husbands hard to bear? Well, this was my Eugene's conclusion. In early youth he had been the prey of every raging mad delusion, and uncurbed passions ruled the day. Quite pampered by a life of leisure, enchanted with each passing pleasure, but disenchanted just as quick, of all desire, at length grown sick, and irked by fleet success soon after, he had here, mid hum and hush alike, his grumbling soul, the hours strike, and smothered yawns with brittle laughter, and so he killed eight years of youth, and lost life's very bloom in truth. He ceased to know infatuation, pursuing bells with little zest, refused, he found quick consolation, betrayed, was always glad to rest. He sought them out with no elation, and left them too without vexation, scarce mindful of their love or spite. Just so a casual guest at night drops in for whist and joins routinely, and then upon the end of play just takes his leave and drives away to fall asleep at home serenely, and in the morning he won't know what evening holds or where he'll go. But having read Tatiana's letter... Onegin was profoundly stirred. Her maiden dreams had helped unfetter a swarm of thoughts with every word, and he recalled Tatiana's pallor, her mournful air, her touching valour, and then he soared, his soul alight with sinless dreams of sweet delight. Perhaps an ancient glow of passion possessed him for a moment's sway. But never would he lead astray a trusting soul in callous fashion, and so let's hasten to the walk where he and Tanya had their talk. Some moments passed in utter quiet, and then Eugene approached and spoke. You wrote to me. Do not deny it. I have read your words, and they evoke my deep respect for your emotion, your trusting soul and sweet devotion. Your candour has a great appeal and stirs in me, I won't conceal, long dormant feelings scarce remembered. But I've no wish to praise you now. Let me repay you with a vow, as artless as the one you tended. Hear my confession too, I plead, and judge me both by word and deed. Had I in any way desired to bind with family ties my life, or had a happy fate required that I turn father, take a wife, had pictures of domestication for but one moment held temptation, then surely none but you alone would be the bride I'd make my own. I'll say, without wrought-up insistence, that finding my ideal in you, I would have asked you, yes, it's true, to share my baneful, sad existence in pledge of beauty and of good, and been as happy as I could. But I'm not made for exaltation. My soul's a stranger to its call. Your virtues are a vain temptation, for I'm not worthy of them all. Believe me, conscience be your token. In wedlock we would both be broken." However much I loved you, dear, once used to you, I'd cease, I fear. You'd start to weep, but all your crying would fail to touch my heart at all. Your tears, in fact, would only gall. So judge yourself what we'd be buying, what Rosie's hymen means to send, quite possibly for years on end. In all this world, 
What's more perverted than homes in which the wretched wife bemoans her worthless mate, deserted, alone, both day and night through life, or where the husband, knowing truly her worth, yet cursing fate unduly, is always angry, sullen, mute, a coldly jealous, selfish brute? Well, thus am I. And was it merely for this your ardent spirit pined when you, with so much strength of mind, unsealed your heart to me so clearly? Can fate indeed be so unkind? Is this the lot you've been assigned? For dreams and youth there's no returning. I cannot resurrect my soul. I love you with a tender yearning, but mine must be a brother's role. So hear me through without vexation. Young maidens find quick consolation from dream to dream a passage brief, just so a sapling sheds its leaf to bud anew each vernal season. Thus heaven wills the world to turn. You'll fall in love again. But learn to exercise restraint and reason, for few will understand you so, and innocence can lead to woe. Thus spake Eugene his admonition, scarce breathing and bereft of speech, gone blind with tears, in full submission, Tatiana listened to him preach. He offered her his arm. Despairing she took it, and with languid bearing, mechanically, as people say, she bowed her head and moved away. They passed the garden's dark recesses, arriving home together thus, where no one raised the slightest fuss, for country freedom too possesses its happy rights, as grand as those that high and mighty Moscow knows. I know that you'll agree, my reader, that our good friend was only kind, and showed poor Tanya, when he freed her, a noble heart and upright mind. Again he'd done his moral duty, but spiteful people saw no beauty, and quickly blamed him, heaven knows, Good friends, no less than ardent foes, but aren't they one if they offend us? Abused him roundly, used the knife. Now every man has foes in life, but from our friends, dear God, defend us. Ah, friends, those friends I greatly fear. I find their friendship much too dear. What's that? Just that. Mere conversation to lull black, empty thoughts a while. In passing, though, one observation. There's not a calumny too vile that any garret babbler hatches and all the social rabble snatches. There's no absurdity or worse, nor any vulgar gutter verse that your good friend won't find delightful, repeating it a hundred ways to decent folk for days and days, while never meaning to be spiteful. He's yours, he'll say, through thick and thin. He loves you so. Why, you're like kin. Mm-hmm, <laughs> dear reader, feeling mellow. And are your kinfolk well today? Perhaps you'd like, you gentle fellow, to hear what I'm prepared to say on kinfolk and their implications. Well, here's my view of close relations. They're people whom we're bound to prize, to honour, love and idolise, and following the old tradition to visit come the Christmas feast, or send a wish, by mail at least. All other days they've our permission to quite forget us if they please, so grant them, God, long life and ease. Of course... The love of tender beauties is surer far than friends or kin. Your claim upon its joyous duties survives when even tempests spin. Of course it's so. And yet be wary, for fashions change and views will vary, and nature's made of wayward stuff. The charming sex is light as fluff. What's more, the husband's frank opinion is bound by any righteous wife to be respected in this life, and so your mistress, faithful minion, may in a trice be swept away, for Satan treats all love as play. But whom to love, to trust and treasure? Who won't betray us in the end? 
and who'll be kind enough to measure our words and deeds as we intend? Who won't so slander all about us? Who'll coddle us and never doubt us? To whom will all our faults be few? Who'll never bore us through and through? You futile, searching phantom breeder, why spend your efforts all in vain? Just love yourself and ease the pain, my most esteemed and honoured reader. A worthy object, never mind. A truer love you'll never find. But what ensued from Tanya's meeting? Alas, it isn't hard to guess. Within her heart the frenzied beating coursed on, and never ceased to press her gentle soul, a thirst with aching. Nay, ever more intensely quaking, poor Tanya burns in joyless throes. Sleep shuns her bed, all sweetness goes. The glow of life has vanished starkly. Her health, her calm, the smile she wore, like empty sounds, exist no more. And Tanya's youth now glimmers darkly. Thus stormy shadows cloak with grey the scarcely risen newborn day. Alas, Tatiana's fading quickly. She's pale and wasted, doesn't speak. Her soul, unmoved, grows wan and sickly. She finds all former pleasures bleak. The neighbours shake their heads morosely and whisper to each other closely, "'It's time she married. Awful waste. But that's enough. I must make haste to cheer the dark imagination with pictures of a happy pair. I can't, though, readers, help but care and feel a deep commiseration. Forgive me, but it's true, you know. I love my dear Tatiana so.' Each passing hour, more captivated by Olga's winning, youthful charms, Vladimir gave his heart and waited to serve sweet bondage with his arms. He's ever near. In gloomy weather they sit in Olga's room together, or arm in arm they make their rounds each morning through the park and grounds. And so, inebriated lover, confused with tender shame the while, encouraged, though, by Olga's smile, he sometimes even dares to cover one loosened curl with soft caress, or kiss the border of her dress. At times he reads her works of fiction, some moralistic novel, say, whose author's powers of depiction make Chateaubriand's work seem grey. But sometimes there are certain pages, outlandish things, mere foolish rages unfit for maiden's heart or head, which Lenski, blushing, leaves unread. They steal away whenever able and sit for hours, seeing naught above the chessboard, deep in thought, their elbows propped upon the table, where Lenski, with his pawn, once took, bemused and muddled, his own rook. When he drives home, she still engages his poet's soul, his artist's mind. He fills her album's fleeting pages with every tribute he can find. He draws sweet views of rustic scenery, a Venus temple, graves and greenery. He pens a lyre and then a dove, adds colour lightly and with love. And on the leaves of recollection, beneath the lines from other hands, he plants a tender verse that stands mute monument to fond reflection, a moment's thought whose trace shall last unchanged when even years have passed. I'm sure you've known provincial misses, their albums too you must have seen, where girlfriends scribble hopes and blisses from front side, back side, in between, with spellings awesome in abusage, unmetered lines of hallowed usage rendered by each would-be friend, diminished, lengthened, turned on end. Upon the first page you'll discover quécrirez vous sur ces tablettes? And neath it, tout à vous, Annette. While on the last one you'll uncover who loves you more than I must sign and fill the page that follows mine. You're sure to find there decorations, rosettes, a torch, a pair of hearts. You'll read, no doubt, fond protestations, with all my love till death us parts. Some army scribbler will have written a roguish rhyme to tease the smitten. 
In just such albums, friends, I too am quite as glad to write as you, for there at heart I feel persuaded that any zealous, vulgar phrase will earn me an indulgent gaze and won't then be evaluated with wicked grin or solemn eye to judge the wit with which I lie. But you, odd tomes of haughty ladies, you gorgeous albums stamped with guilt, you libraries of darkest Hades and racks where modish rhymesters wilt, you volumes nimbly ornamented by Tolstoy's magic brush and scented by Baratinsky's pen, I vow let God's own lightning strike you now. Whenever dazzling ladies proffer their quartos to be signed by me, I tremble with malicious glee. My soul cries out and longs to offer an epigram of cunning spite. But madrigals they'll have you write. No madrigals of mere convention does Olga Zlensky thus compose. His pen breathes love. Not pure invention or sparkling wit as cold as prose. Whatever comes to his attention concerning Olga, that he'll mention. And filled with truth's own vivid glows, a stream of elegies then flows. Thus you, Yazikov, with perfection, with all the surgings of your heart, sing God knows whom in splendid art, sweet elegies, whose full collection will on some future day relate the uncut story of your fate. But hush, a strident critic rises and bids us cast away the crown of elegy in all its guises, and to our rhyming guild calls down... Have done with all your lamentations, your endless croakings and gyrations on former days and times of yore. Enough now. Sing of something more. You're right. And will you point with praises to trumpet, mask, and dagger too, and bid us thuswise to renew our stock of dead ideas and phrases? Is that it, friend? Far from it. Nay, write odes, good sirs, write odes, I say, the way they did in former ages, those mighty years still rich in fame, just solemn odes, on all our pages? Oh, come now, friend, it's all the same. Recall the satirist, good brother, and his sly odist in The Other. Do you find him more pleasing, pray, than our glum rhymesters of today? Your elegy lacks all perception. Its want of purpose is a crime, whereas the ode has aims sublime. One might to this take sharp exception, but I'll be mute. I don't propose to bring two centuries to blows. By thoughts of fame and freedom smitten, Vladimir's stormy soul grew wings. What odes indeed he might have written, but Olga didn't read the things. How oft have tearful poets chances to read their works before the glances of those they love? Good sense declares that no reward on earth compares. How blessed, shy lover, to be granted to read to her for whom you long, the very object of your song, a beauty languid and enchanted. Ah, blessed indeed, although it's true she may be dreaming not of you. But I, my fancies, fruits and flowers, those dreams and harmonies I tend, am quite content to read for hours to my old nurse, my childhood's friend, or sometimes, after dinner's dreary, when some good neighbour drops in weary, I'll corner him and catch his coat and stuff him with the play I wrote, or else, and here I'm far from jesting, when off beside my lake I climb, beset with yearning and with rhyme, I scare a flock of ducks from resting, and hearing my sweet stanzas soar, they flap their wings and fly from shore. And as I watch them disappearing, a hunter hidden in the brush damns poetry for interfering, and, whistling, fires with a rush. Each has his own preoccupation, his favourite sport or avocation. One aims a gun at ducks on high, one is entranced by rhyme, as I. One swats at flies in mindless folly, one dreams of ruling multitudes, 
One craves the scent that war exudes. One likes to bask in melancholy. One occupies himself with wine, and good and bad all intertwine. But what of our Eugene this while? Have patience, friends, I beg you pray. I'll tell it all in detailed style, and show you how he spent each day. Onegin lived in his own heaven. In summer he'd get up by seven, and, lightly clad, would take a stroll down to the stream below the knoll. Gulnar's proud singer, his example, he'd swim across this hellespont. Then afterwards, as was his wont, he'd drink his coffee, sometimes sample the pages of some dull review, and then he'd dress. Long rambles, reading, slumbers, blisses, the burbling brook, the wooded shade, at times the fresh and youthful kisses of white-skinned, dark-eyed country maid, a horse of spirit fit to bridle, a dinner fanciful and idle, a bottle of some sparkling wine, seclusion, quiet. These, in fine, were my Onegin's saintly pleasures, to which he yielded one by one, unmoved to count beneath the sun fair summer's days and careless treasures, unmindful, too, of town or friends and their dull means to festive ends. Our northern summers, though, are versions of southern winters, this is clear, and though we're loath to cast aspersions, they seem to go before they're here. The sky breathed autumn, turned and darkled, the friendly sun less often sparkled, the days grew short, and as they sped, the wood, with mournful murmur, shed its wondrous veil to stand uncovered, the fields all lay in misty peace, the caravan of cackling geese turned south, and all around there hovered the sombre season near at hand, November marched across the land. The dawn arises cold and cheerless, the empty fields in silence wait, and on the road, grown lean and fearless, the wolf appears with hungry mate. Catching the scent, the road horse quivers and snorts in fear, the traveller shivers and flies uphill with all his speed. No more at dawn does shepherd need to drive the cows outside with ringing, nor does his horn at midday sound the call that brings them gathering round. Inside her hut a girl is singing, and by the matchwood's crackling light she spins away the wintry night. The frost already cracks and crunches, the fields are silver where they froze, and you, good reader, with your hunches, expect the rhyme, so take it, rose. No fine parquet could hope to muster the ice-clad river's glassy luster. The joyous tribe of boys berates and cuts the ice with ringing skates. A waddling red-foot goose now scurries to swim upon the water's breast. He treads the ice with care to test, and down he goes. The first snow flurries come flitting, flicking, swirling round to fall like stars upon the ground. But how is one, in this dull season, to help the rural day go by? Take walks? The views give little reason when only bareness greets the eye. Go ride the steps, harsh open spaces? Your mount, if put to try his paces on treacherous ice in blunted shoe, is sure to fall, and so will you. So, stay beneath your roof, try reading. Here's Pratt, or better, Walter Scott. Or check accounts. You'd rather not? Then rage or drink. Somehow proceeding, this night will pass. The next one, too, and grandly you'll see winter through. Child Harold-like, Onegin ponders adrift in idle, slothful ways. From bed to icy bath he wanders, and then at home all day he stays. Alone and sunk in calculation, his only form of recreation, the game of billiards, all day through with just two balls and blunted cue. But as the rural dusk encroaches, the cue's forgot, the billiards fade, before the hearth the table's laid, he waits. At last his guest approaches. 
It's Lenski's troika, three fine roans. Come on, let's dine, my stomach groans. Moet, that wine most blessed and heady, or Verve Clicquot, the finest class, is brought in, bottle chilled and ready, and set beside the poet's glass. Like hippocrene, it sparkles brightly, it fizzes, foams, and bubbles lightly, a simile in many ways. It charmed me, too, in other days. For its sake once I squandered gladly my last poor pence, remember, friend? Its magic stream brought forth no end of acting foolish, raving madly, and oh, how many jests and rhymes and arguments and happy times. But all that foamy, frothy wheezing just plays my stomach false, I fear, and nowadays I find more pleasing sedate Bordeaux's good, quiet cheer. Aye, I find, is much too risky. Aye, is like a mistress, frisky, vivacious, brilliant, and too light. But you, Bordeaux, I find just right. You're like a comrade, ever steady, prepared in trials or in grief to render service, give relief, and when we wish it, always ready to share a quiet evening's end. Long live Bordeaux, our noble friend. The fire goes out. The coal, still gleaming, takes on a film of ash and pales. The rising vapours, faintly streaming, curl out of sight. The hearth exhales a breath of warmth. The pipe smoke passes up chimney flue. The sparkling glasses stand fizzing on the table yet. With evening's gloom, the day has set. I'm fond of friendly conversation and of a friendly glass or two, at dusk or entre chien et loup, as people say without translation, though why they do I hardly know, but listen as our friends speak low. And how are our dear neighbours faring? Tatiana and your Olga, pray. Just half a glass, old boy, be sparing. The family's well, I think I'd say. They send you greetings and affection. Oh, God, my friend, what sheer perfection in Olga's breast. What shoulders, too, and what a soul. Come, visit, do. You ought to, really, they'll be flattered. Or judge yourself how it must look. You dropped in twice and closed the book. Since then, it seems, they've hardly mattered. In fact, good Lord, my wits are bleak. You've been invited there next week. Tatiana's name-day celebration is Saturday. Her mother sent, and Olga too, an invitation. Now don't refuse. It's time you went. There'll be a crush and lots of babble and all that crowd of local rabble. Why not at all? They just intend to have the family. That's all, friend. Come on, let's go. Do me the favour. All right, I'll go. Well done, first class, and with these words he drained his glass in toast to his attractive neighbour, and then waxed voluble once more in talk of Olga. Love's a bore. So Lenski soared as he awaited his wedding day two weeks ahead. With joy his heart anticipated the mysteries of the marriage bed, and love's sweet crown of jubilations. But Hymen's cares and tribulations, the frigid, yawning days to be, he never pictured once, not he. While we, the foes of Hymen's banner, perceive full well that home life means but one long string of dreary scenes in La Fontaine's insipid manner. But my poor Lenski, deep at heart, was born to play this very part. Yes, he was loved, beyond deceiving, or so at least with joy he thought. Oh, blessed is he who lives believing, who takes cold intellect for naught, who rests within the heart's sweet places, as does a drunk in sleep's embraces, or as, more tenderly, I'd say, a butterfly in blooms of May. But wretched he who's too far-sighted, whose head is never fancy-stirred, who hates all gestures, each warm word, as sentiments to be derided, whose heart experience has cooled, and barred from being loved or fooled. Chapter 
Chapter 5 Oh, never know these frightful dreams, my dear Svetlana. Zhukovsky The fall that year was in no hurry, and nature seemed to wait and wait for winter. Then, in January, the second night, the snow fell late. Next day, as dawn was just advancing, Tatiana woke, and idly glancing, beheld outdoors a wondrous sight. The roofs, the yard, the fence, all white. Each pane a fragile pattern showing. The trees in winter silver dyed. Gay magpies on the lawn outside, and all the hilltops soft and glowing, with winter's brilliant rug of snow, the world all fresh and white below. Ah, winter time! The peasant, cheerful, creates a passage with his sleigh. Aware of snow, his nag is fearful, but shambles somehow down the way. A bold kibitka skips and burrows and ploughs a trail of fluffy furrows. The driver sits behind the dash in sheepskin coat and scarlet sash. And here's a household boy gone sleighing, his blackie seated on the sled, while he plays horse and runs ahead. The rascal throws his fingers playing and laughs out loud between his howls, while through the glass his mother scowls. But you, perhaps, are not attracted by pictures of this simple kind, where lowly nature is enacted and nothing grand or more refined. Warmed by the god of inspiration, another bard, in exaltation, has painted us the snow new laid and winter's joys in every shade. I'm sure you'll find him most engaging when he in flaming verse portrays clandestine rides in dashing sleighs. But I have no intent of waging a contest for his crown, or thine, thou bard of Finland's maid divine. Tatiana, with a Russian duty that held her heart she knew not why, profoundly loved in its cold beauty the Russian winter passing by. Crisp days when sunlit hoarfrost glimmers, the sleighs and rosy snow that shimmers in sunset's glow, the murky light that wraps about the yuletide night, those twelfth-tide eves by old tradition were marked at home on their estate. The servant maids would guess the fate of both young girls with superstition. Each year they promised, as before, two soldier husbands and a war. Tatiana heeded with conviction all ancient folklore, night and noon, believed in dreams and card prediction, and read the future by the moon. All signs and portents quite alarmed her, all objects either scared or charmed her, with secret meanings they'd impart. Forebodings filled and pressed her heart. If her prim tomcat sat protected atop the stove to wash and purr, then this was certain sign to her that guests were soon to be expected. Or if upon her left she'd spy a waxing crescent moon on high, her face would pale, her teeth would chatter. Or when a shooting star flew by to light the sombre sky and shatter in fiery dust before her eye, she'd hurry and in agitation before the star's disintegration would whisper it her secret prayer. Or if she happened anywhere to meet a black-robed monk by error, or if amid the fields one day a fleeing hare would cross her way, she'd be quite overcome with terror as dark forebodings filled her mind of some misfortune ill-defined. Yet even in these same afflictions she found a secret charm in part, for nature, fond of contradictions, has so designed the human heart. The holy days are here. What gladness! Bright youth divines, not knowing sadness, with nothing that it must regret, with all of life before it yet, a distant, luminous and boundless, Old age divines with glasses on, and sees the grave before it yawn, all thoughts of time returning, groundless. No matter, childish hope appears to murmur lies in aged ears. Tatiana watches, fascinated, the molten wax submerge and turn to wondrous shapes, which designated some wondrous thing that she would learn. 
Then, from a basin filled with water, their rings are drawn in random order. When Tanya's ring turned up at last, the song they sang was from the past. The peasants there have hordes of treasure. They spade up silver from a ditch. The one we sing to will be rich and famous. But the plaintive measure foretells a death to come ere long, and girls prefer the kitty's song. A frosty night, the sky resplendent as heaven's galaxy shines down and glides, so peaceful and transcendent, Tatiana, in her low-cut gown, steps out of doors and trains a mirror upon the moon to bring it nearer. But all that shows in her dark glass is just the trembling moon, alas. What's that? The crunching snow. Who's coming? She flits on tiptoe with a sigh and asks the stranger passing by, her voice more soft than reed pipes humming. Oh, what's your name? He hurries on, looks back and answers, Agathon. Tatiana, as her nurse suggested, prepared to conjure all night through, and so in secret she requested the bathhouse table laid for two. But then sheer terror sees Tatiana, and I, recalling poor Svetlana, feel frightened too. So let it go. We'll not have Tanya conjure so. Instead, her silken sash untying, she just undressed and went to bed. Sweet lay now floats above her head, while neath her downy pillow lying, a maiden's looking-glass she keeps. Now all is hushed. Tatiana sleeps. And what an awesome dream she's dreaming. She walks upon a snowy dale, and all around her, dully gleaming, sad mist and murky gloom prevail. Amid the drifting snowbound spaces, a dark and seething torrent races. A hoary, frothing wave that strains and tears asunder winter's chains. Two slender, ice-bound poles lie linking the chasm's banks atop the ridge, a perilous and shaky bridge. And full of doubt, her spirit sinking, Tatiana stopped in sudden dread before the raging gulf ahead. As at a vexing separation, Tatiana murmured at a loss. She saw no friendly soul on station to lend a hand to help her cross, but suddenly a snowbank shifted. And who emerged when it was lifted? A huge and matted bear appeared. Tatiana screamed. He growled and reared, then stretched a paw, sharp claws abhorrent to Tanya, who could barely stand. She took it with a trembling hand and worked her way across the torrent with apprehensive step, then fled. The bear just followed where she led. She dare not look to see behind her, and ever faster on she reels. At every turn he seems to find her, that shaggy footman at her heels. The grunting, loathsome bear still lumbers. Before them now a forest slumbers. The pines in all their beauty frown, and barely stir, all weighted down by clumps of snow. And through the summits of naked linden, birch and ash, the beams from heaven's lanterns flash. There is no path. The gourds that plummet, the shrubs, the land, all lie asleep by snowy blizzards buried deep. She's reached the wood, the bear still tracking. Soft snow, knee-deep, lies all about. A jutting branch looms up, attacking, and tears her golden earrings out. And now another tries to trip her, and from one charming foot her slipper, all wet, comes off in crumbly snow. And now she feels her kerchief go. She lets it lie. She mustn't linger. Behind her back she hears the bear, but shy and frightened, does not dare to lift her skirt with trembling finger. She runs, but he keeps crashing on until at last her strength is gone. She sinks in snow. The bear alertly just picks her up and rushes on. She lies within his arms inertly. Her breathing stops. All sense is gone. Along a forest road he surges, and then, mid-trees, a hut emerges. 
Dense brush abounds. On every hand, forlorn and drifting snowbanks stand. A tiny window glitters brightly, and from the hut come cries and din. The bear proclaims, My gossip's in. Come warm yourself, he adds politely, then pushes straightway through the door and lays her down upon the floor. On coming to, she looks around her. She's in a hall. No bear, at least. The clink of glasses shouts, confound her, as if it were some funeral feast. She can't make sense of what she's hearing, creeps to the door and, softly peering, sees through a crack the strangest thing. A horde of monsters in a ring. Out of a dog face, horns are sprouting. One has a rooster's head on top. A goateed witch is on a mop. A haughty skeleton sits pouting beside a short-tailed dwarf, and that is half a crane and half a cat. More wondrous still and still more fearful, a crab upon a spider sat. On Goose's neck a skull seemed cheerful while spinning round in bright red hat. A windmill there was, squat-jig dancing, and cracked and waved its sails while prancing, guffawing, barking, whistles, claps, and human speech, and hoofbeat taps. But what was Tanya's stunned reaction when, mid the guests, she recognised the one she feared, the one she prized, the hero of our novel's action. Onegin sits amid the roar, and glances slyly through the door. He gives a sign. The others hustle. He drinks. All drink, and all grow shrill. He laughs. They all guffaw and bustle. He frowns, and all of them grow still. He's master here, there's no mistaking. And Tanya, now no longer quaking, turns curious to see still more, and pushes slightly on the door. The sudden gust of wind... Surprises the band of goblins, putting out the nighttime lanterns all about. His eyes are flame, Onegin rises and strikes his chair against the floor. All rise, he marches to the door. And fear assails her. In a panic, she tries to flee, but feels too weak. In anguished writhing, almost manic, she wants to scream, but cannot speak. Eugene throws wide the door, revealing to monstrous looks and hellish squealing her slender form. Fierce cackles sound in savage glee. All eyes turn round, all hooves and trunks, grotesque and curving, and whiskers, tusks and tufted tails, red bloody tongues and snouts and nails, huge horns and bony fingers swerving, all point at her and all combine to shout as one, She's mine! She's mine! "'She's mine!' announced Eugene, commanding. And all the monsters fled the room. The maid alone was left there standing with him amid the frosty gloom. Onegin stares at her intently, then draws her to a corner gently and lays her on a makeshift bed, and on her shoulder rests his head. Then Olga enters in confusion, and Lensky too. A light shines out. Onegin lifts an arm to rout unbidden guests for their intrusion. He rants at them. His eyes turn dread. Tatiana lies there, nearly dead. The heated words grow louder, quicken. Onegin snatches up a knife, and Lensky falls. The shadows thicken. A rending cry amid the strife reverberates. The cabin quivers. Gone numb with terror, Tanya shivers and wakes to find her room alight, the frozen windows sparkling bright where dawn's vermilion rays are playing. Then Olga pushes through the door, more rosy than the dawn before and lighter than a swallow, saying, Oh, tell me, do, Tatiana, love, who was it you were dreaming of? But she ignores her sister's pleading, just lies in bed without a word, keeps leafing through some book she's reading, so wrapped in thought she hasn't heard, 
although the book she read presented no lines a poet had invented, no sapient truths, no pretty scenes, yet neither Virgil's, nor Racine's, nor Seneca's, nor Byron's pages, nor even fashion plates displayed, had ever so engrossed a maid. She read, my friends, that king of sages, Martin Zadek, Chaldean seer, and analyst of dreams unclear. This noble and profound creation a roving peddler one day brought to show them in their isolation, and finally left it when they bought Malvina for three roubles fifty, a broken set, but he was thrifty, and in exchange he also took two petriads, a grammar book, some fables he could sell tomorrow, plus Marmontel, just volume three. Martin Zadek soon came to be Tatiana's favourite. Now when sorrow assails her heart, he brings her light, and sleeps beside her through the night. Her dream disturbs her, and not knowing what secret message she had been sent, Tatiana seeks some passage showing just what the dreadful vision meant. She finds, in alphabetic order, what clues the index can afford her. There's bear and blizzard, bridge and crow, fir, forest, hedgehog, night and snow, and many more. But her confusion Martin Zadek cannot dispel. The frightful vision must foretell sad times to come and disillusion. For several days she couldn't find a way to calm her troubled mind. But lo! With crimson hand, Aurora leads forth from morning dales the sun, and brings in merry mood before her the name-day feast that's just begun. Since dawn, Dame Larin's near relations have filled the house. Whole congregations of neighbour clans have come in drays, kibitkas, britskas, coaches, sleighs. The hall is full of crowds and bustle. The drawing-room explodes with noise, with bark of pugs and maidens' joys, with laughter, kisses, din and hustle. The guests all bow and scrape their feet, wet nurses shout and babies bleat. Fat Pustyakov, the local charmer, has come and brought his portly wife. Gvozdin as well, that model farmer, whose peasants lead a wretched life. The two Skotinins, grey as sages, with children of all shapes and ages, from two to thirty at the top. Here's Petushkov, the district fop, and my first cousin, good Buyanov, lint-covered in his visored cap, as you of course well know the chap, and former councillor old man Flyanov, a rogue and gossip night and noon, a glutton, grafter and buffoon. The Harlikovs were feeling mellow, and brought along Monsieur Triquet, late from Tamboff, a witty fellow in russet wig and fine pince-nez. True Gaul, Triquet in pocket carried, a verse to warn that Tanya tarried, set to a children's melody, Réveillez-vous, belle endormie. The printed verse had lain neglected in some old tattered almanac, until Triquet, who had a knack for rhyme, saw fit to resurrect it, and boldly put for Belle Nina the charming line, Belle Tatiana. And now from nearby quarters, brothers, that idol whom ripe misses cheer, the joy and hope of district mothers, the company commanders here. He's brought some news to set them cheering, the regimental bands appearing. The colonel's sending it tonight. There'll be a ball. What sheer delight. The girls all jump and grow excited, but dinner's served, and so by pairs and arm in arm they seek their chairs. The girls near Tanya, men delighted to face them, and amid the din all cross themselves and dig right in. Then... For a moment, chatter ceases as mouths start chewing. All around, the clink of plates and forks increases, the glasses jingle and resound, but soon the guests are somewhat sated. The hubbub grows more animated, but no one hears his neighbour out. All laugh and argue, squeal and shout. The doors fly back. Two figures enter. It's Lensky with Eugene. Oh, Dear, the hostess cries, at last you're here. The guests all squeeze toward the centre, each moves his setting, shifts his chair, and in a trice they seat the pair. 
across from Tanya. There they place them, and paler than the moon at dawn, she cannot raise her eyes to face them, and trembles like a hunted fawn. Inside her, stormy passions seething, the wretched girl is scarcely breathing. The two friends' greetings pass unheard. Her tears well up without a word and almost fall. The poor thing's ready to faint, but deep within her, will and strength of mind were working still, and they prevailed. Her lips more steady, she murmured something through her pain, and managed somehow to remain. All tragico-hysteric moaning, all girlish fainting fits and tears, had long since set Eugene to groaning. He had borne enough in former years. Already cross and irritated by being at this feast he hated, and noting how poor Tanya shook, he barely hid his angry look and fumed in sullen indignation. He swore that he'd make Lenski pay and be avenged that very day. Exulting in anticipation, he inwardly began to draw caricatures of those he saw. Some others, too, might well have noted poor Tanya's plight, but every eye was at the time in full devoted to sizing up a lavish pie. Alas, too salty. Now they're bringing in bottle with the pitch still clinging between the meat and blancmanger, Tsimlyansky wine, a whole array of long-stemmed glasses, quite as slender as your dear waist, my sweet Zizi, fair crystal of my soul and key to all my youthful verses tender, love's luring file, you who once made me a drunken, love-filled dunce. The bottle pops, as cork goes flying, the fizzing wine comes gushing fast, and now, with solemn mien, and dying to have his couplet heard at last, Triquet stands up. The congregation falls silent in anticipation. Tatiana's scarce alive. Triquet, with verse in hand, looks Tanya's way and starts to sing, off-key. Loud cheering and claps salute him. Tanya feels constrained to curtsy, almost reels. The bard, whose modesty is endearing, is first to toast her where he stands, then puts his couplet in her hands. Now greetings come, congratulations. Tatiana thanks them for the day, but when Eugene's felicitations came due in turn, the girl's dismay, her weariness and helpless languor, evoked his pity more than anger. He bowed to her in silence, grave, but somehow just the look he gave was wondrous tender. If asserting some feeling for Tatiana's lot, or if, unconsciously or not, he'd only teased her with some flirting, his look was still a tender dart. It reawakened Tanya's heart. The chairs, pushed back, gave out a clatter. The crowd moves on to drawing-room. Thus bees from luscious hive will scatter a noisy swarm to meadow bloom. Their festive dinner, all too pleasing, the squires face each other wheezing. The ladies to the hearth repair, the maidens whisper by the stair. At green bay's tables players settle. As Boston, ombre, old men's play, and whist, which reigns supreme today, call out for men to try their mettle. A family with a single creed, all sons of boredom's endless greed. Whist's heroes have by now completed eight rubbers, and eight times as well they've shifted round and been reseated. Now tea is brought. I like to tell the time of day by teas and dinners, by supper's call. We country sinners can tell the time without great fuss. The stomach serves as clock for us. And apropos, I might make mention in passing that I speak as much of feasts and foods and corks and such in these odd lines of my invention as you, great Homer, you whose song has lasted thirty centuries long. But tea is brought. The girls, demurely, have scarcely taken cups in hand when suddenly, from ballroom doorway, bassoon and flute announce the band. 
Elated by the music's bouncing, his tea and rum at once renouncing that Paris of the local towns, good Petushkov to Olga bounds. To Tanya Lensky, Harlikova, a maiden somewhat ripe in glow, my Tamboff poet takes in tow. Buyanov whirls off Pustyakova, then all the crowd comes pouring in to watch the brilliant ballroom spin. At the beginning of my story, in chapter one, if you recall, I wanted, with Albani's glory, to paint a Petersburg grand ball. But then, by empty dreams deflected, I lost my way and recollected the feet of ladies known before. In your slim tracks I'll stray no more, O oh, charming feet and mad affliction. My youth betrayed, it's time to show more common sense if I'm to grow, to mend my ways in deeds and diction, and cleanse this chapter five at last of all digressions from the past. Monotonous and mad procession, young life's own whirlwind, full of sound, each pair a blur in quick succession, the rousing waltz goes whirling round. His moment of revenge beginning, Eugene, with secret malice grinning, approaches Olga, idly jests, then spins her round before the guests. He stays beside her when she's seated, proceeds to talk of this and that. Two minutes barely has she sat, and then their waltzing is repeated. The guests all stare in mute surprise. Poor Lensky can't believe his eyes. Now the mazurka's call is sounded. Its thunder once could even rack the greatest hall when it resounded, and under heels parquet would crack. The very windows shook like Hades. But now it's changed, we're all like ladies, and o'er the lacquered boards we glide. But in small town and countryside the old mazurka hasn't faltered. It still retains its pristine joys. Moustaches, leaps, heel-pounding noise remain the same. They've not been altered by tyrant fashion's high decrees, the modern Russian's new disease. My bold Buyanov guides expertly Tatyana to our hero's side, and Olga too. Eugene alertly makes off with Lensky's future bride. He steers her, gliding nonchalantly, and bending whispers her gallantly, some common madrigal to please, then gives her hand a gentle squeeze. She blushes in appreciation, her prim, conceited face alight, while Lensky rages at the sight. Consumed with jealous indignation, he waits till the mazurka's through, then asks her for the dance he's due. But no, she can't. What explanation? Well, she's just promised his good friend the next dance, too. In God's creation! What's this he hears? Could she intend? Can this be real? Scarce more than swaddler and turned coquette, a fickle toddler. Already has she mastered guile, already learned to cheat and smile. The blow has left poor Lensky shattered. And cursing woman's crooked course, he leaves abruptly, calls for horse and gallops off. Now nothing mattered. A brace of pistols and a shot shall instantly decide his lot. Chapter 6 La sotto i giorni nubilosi e brevi nasce una gente a cui il morir non dole. Petrarch Though pleased with the revenge he'd taken, Onegin, noting Lenskid left, felt all his old... On we awaken, which made poor Olga feel bereft. She too now yawns, and as she dances, seeks Lensky out with furtive glances. The endless dance had come to seem to Olga like some dreadful dream. But now it's over. Supper's heeded. Then beds are made, the guests are all assigned their rooms, from entrance hall to servants' quarters. Rest is needed by everyone. Eugene has fled and driven home alone to bed. All's quiet now. 
Inside the parlour, the portly Mr. Pustyakov lies snoring with his portly partner. Gvozdin, Buyanov, Petushkov and Flyanov, who'd been reeling badly on dining chairs, have bedded gladly. While on the floor, Trike's at rest in tattered nightcap and his vest, the rooms of Olga and Tatiana are filled with girls in sleep's embrace. Alone beside the window case, illumined sadly by Diana, poor Tanya, sleepless and in pain, sits gazing at the darkened plain. His unexpected reappearance, that momentary tender look, the strangeness of his interference with Olga, all confused and shook Tatiana's soul. His true intention remained beyond her comprehension, and jealous anguish pierced her breast, as if a chilling hand had pressed her heart, as if in awful fashion a rumbling black abyss did yawn. I'll die she whispers to the dawn, but death from him is sweet compassion. Why murmur vainly, he can't give the happiness for which I live. But forward, forward, O oh my story, a new persona has arrived. Five versts or so from Krasnogori, Arlensky's seat, there lived and thrived in philosophical seclusion, and does so still have no illusion, Zaretsky. Once a rowdy clown, chief gambler and arch-rake in town, the tavern tribune and a liar, but now a kind and simple soul who plays an unwed father's role, a faithful friend, a peaceful squire, and a man of honour, nothing less. Thus does our age its sins redress. Time was when flunkies in high places would praise him for his nasty grit. He could, it's true, from twenty paces, shoot pistol at an ace and hit. And once, when riding battle station, he'd earned a certain reputation when in a frenzied state indeed he'd plunged in mud from Kalmuk steed, drunk as a pig, and suffered capture, a prize to make the French feel proud, like noble Regulus. He bowed accepting hostage bonds with rapture, in hopes that he, on charge, might squeeze three bottles daily from Verise. He used to banter, rather neatly, could gull a fool, and had an eye for fooling clever men completely, for all to see or on the sly. Of course, not all his pranks succeeded or passed unpunished or unheeded, and sometimes he himself got bled and ended up the dunce instead. He loved good, merry disputations, could answer keenly, be obtuse, put silence cunningly to use, or cunningly start altercations, could get two friends prepared to fight, then lead them to the duelling site or else he'd patch things up between them so he might lunch with them as guest, and later secretly demean them with nasty gossip or a jest, said Alia Temporal. Such sporting, with other capers such as courting, goes out of us when youth is dead, and my Zaretsky, as I've said, neath flowering cherries and acacias, secure at last from tempest's rage, lives out his life a proper sage, plants cabbages like old Horatius, breeds ducks and geese, and oversees his children at their ABCs. He was no fool, and consequently, although he thought him lacking heart, Eugene would hear his views intently, and liked his common sense in part. He had spent some time with him with pleasure, and so was not in any measure surprised next morning when he found Zaretsky had again called round. The latter, hard upon first greeting and cutting off Eugene's reply, presented him, with gloating eye, the poet's note about a meeting. Onegin, taking it, withdrew, and by the window read it through. The note was brief in its correctness, a proper challenge or cartel. Politely, but with cold directness, it called him out, and did it well. Onegin, 
with his first reaction, quite curtly offered satisfaction and bade the envoy, if he cared, to say that he was quite prepared. Avoiding further explanation, Zaretsky, pleading much to do, arose and instantly withdrew. Eugene, once left to contemplation and face to face with his own soul, felt far from happy with his role. And rightly so. In inquisition with conscience as his judge of right, he found much wrong in his position. First off, he had been at fault last night to mock in such a casual fashion at tender love's still timid passion. And why not let the poet rage? A fool at eighteen years of age can be excused his rash intentions. Eugene, who loved the youth at heart, might well have played a better part. No plaything of the mob's conventions or brawling boy to take offence, but man of honour and of sense. He could have shown some spark of feeling instead of bristling like a beast. He should have spoken words of healing, disarmed youth's heart, or tried at least. Too late, he thought. The moment's wasted. What's more, that dueling fox has tasted his chance to mix in this affair. That wicked gossip with his flair for jibes and all his foul dominion. He's hardly worth contempt, I know, but fools will whisper, grin and crow. So there it is, the mob's opinion, the spring with which our honours wound, the god that makes this world go round. At home, the poet, seething, paces and waits impatiently to hear. Then, in his babbling neighbour races, the answer in his solemn leer. The jealous poet's mood turned festive. He'd been, till now, uncertain, restive, afraid the scoundrel might refuse or laugh it off and, through some ruse, escape unscathed the slippery devil. But now, at last, his doubts were gone. Next day, for sure, they'd drive at dawn out to the mill, where each would level a pistol, cocked and lifted high, to aim at temple or at thigh. Convinced that Olga's heart was cruel, Vladimir vowed he wouldn't run to see that flirt before the duel. He kept consulting watch and sun, then gave it up and finally ended outside the door of his intended. He thought she'd blush with self-reproach, grow flustered when she saw his coach, but not at all. As blithe as ever, she bounded from the porch above and rushed to greet her rhyming love like giddy hope. So gay and clever, so frisky carefree with her grin, she seemed the same she'd always been. "'Why did you leave last night so early?' was all that Olga, smiling, said. Paul Lenski's muddled mind was swirling, and silently he hung his head. All jealousy and rage departed before that gaze so open-hearted, before that soft and simple trust, before that soul so bright and just. With misty eyes he looks on sweetly and sees the truth. She loves him yet. Tormented now by deep regret, he craves her pardon so completely, he trembles, hunts for words in vain. He's happy now, he's almost sane. Once more, in solemn, rapt attention before his darling Olga's face, Vladimir hasn't heart to mention the night before and what took place. It's up to me he thought, to save her. I'll never let that foul deprave her, corrupt her youthful heart with lies, with fiery praise and heated sighs, nor see that noxious worm devour my lovely lily, stalk and blade, nor watch this two-day blossom fade when it has yet to fully flower. All this, dear readers, meant in fine, I'm duelling with a friend of mine. Had Lenski known the deep emotion that seared my Tanya's wounded heart, 
or had Tatiana had some notion of how these two had grown apart, or that by morn they'd be debating for which of them the grave lay waiting, ah, then perhaps the love she bore might well have made them friends once more. But no one knew her inclination, or chanced upon the sad affair. Eugene had kept his silent air, Tatiana pined in isolation, and only Nanny might have guessed, but her old wits were slow at best. All evening Lenski was abstracted, remote one moment, gay the next, but those on whom the muse has acted are ever thus, with brow perplexed he'd sit at clavichord intently, and play but chords, or turning gently to Olga, he would whisper low, "'I'm happy, love. It's true, you know. But now it's late, and time for leaving. His heart, so full of pain, drew tight, and as he bid the girl good night, he felt it break with desperate grieving. "'What's wrong?' she peered at him intent. "'It's nothing,' and away he went. On coming home, the youth inspected his pistols, then he put them back. Undressed, by candle, he selected a book of Schiller's from the rack. But only one bright image holds him, one thought within his heart enfolds him. He sees before him, wondrous fair, his incandescent Olga there. He shuts the book, and with decision takes up his pen, his verses ring with all the nonsense lovers sing, and feverish with lyric vision he reads them out like one possessed, like drunken Delvig at a fest. By chance those verses haven't vanished. I have them, and I quote them here. Ah, whither, whither are ye banished, my springtime's golden days so dear? What fate will morning bring, my lyre? In vain my searching eyes inquire, for all lies veiled in misty dust. No matter, fate's decree is just, and whether pierced I fall anointed, or arrow passes by, all's right. The hours of waking and of night come each in turn as they're appointed, and blessed with all its cares the day, and blessed the dark that comes to stay. The morning star will gleam tomorrow, and brilliant day begin to bloom, while I perhaps descend in sorrow, the secret refuge of the tomb. Slow Lethe then, with grim insistence, will drown my memory's brief existence. Of me the world shall soon grow dumb, but thou, fair maiden, wilt thou come? to shed a tear in desolation, and think at my untimely grave. He loved me, and for me he gave his mournful life in consecration. Beloved friend, sweet friend, I wait. O oh, come, O oh, come, I am thy mate. He wrote thus, limply and obscurely, we say romantically, although that's not romanticism, surely, and if it is, who wants to know? But then, at last, as it was dawning, with drooping head and frequent yawning, upon the modish word ideal, Vladimir gently dozed for real. But sleep had hardly come to take him off to be charmed by dreams and cheered, when in that silent room appeared his neighbour, calling out to wake him. It's time to rise, past six, come on. I'll bet on Egin woke at dawn. But he was wrong. That idle sinner was sleeping soundly even then. But now the shades of night grow thinner. The cock hails Vesper once again. Yet still Onegin slumbers deeply. But now the sun climbs heaven steeply, and gusting snowflakes flash and spin. But still Onegin lies within and hasn't stirred. Still slumber hovers above his bed and holds him fast. But now he slowly wakes at last, draws back the curtains and his covers, looks out, and sees with some dismay he'd better leave without delay. 
He rings in haste, and with a racket, his French valet, Guillot, runs in with slippers and a dressing jacket and fresh new linen from the bin. Onegin, dressing in a flurry, instructs his man as well to hurry. They're leaving for the dueling place, Guillot's to fetch the pistol case. The sleigh's prepared, his pacing ceases. He climbs aboard, and off they go. They reach the mill. He bids Guillot to bring Lepage's deadly pieces. Then has the horses on command removed to where two oaklings stand. Impatient, but in no great panic, Vladimir waited near the dam. Meanwhile, Zaretsky, born mechanic, was carping at the millstone's cam. Onegin, late, made explanation. Zaretsky frowned in consternation. Good God, man, where's your second? Where? In duels, a purist doctrinaire, Zaretsky favoured stout reliance on proper form. He had not allowed dispatching chaps just anyhow, but called for strict and full compliance with rules, traditions, ancient ways, which we, of course, in him should praise. My second, said Eugene directly, uh, why, here he is, Monsieur Guillot, a friend of mine, whom you, correctly, will be quite pleased to greet, I know. Though he's unknown and lives obscurely, he's still an honest chap, most surely. Zaretsky bit his lip, well vexed. Onegin turned to Lensky next. Shall we begin? At my insistence. Behind the mill, without a word. And while the honest chap conferred with our Zaretsky at a distance and sealed the solemn compact fast, the foes stood by with eyes downcast. The foes! How long has bloodlust parted and so estranged these former friends? How long ago did they, warm-hearted, share meals and pastimes, thoughts and ends, and now, malignant in intention like ancient foes in mad dissension, as in a dreadful, senseless dream, they glower coldly as they scheme in silence to destroy each other? Should they not laugh while yet there's time, before their hands are stained with crime? Should each not part once more as brother? But enmity among their class holds shame in savage dread, alas. The gleaming pistols wake from drowsing. Against the ramrods mallets pound. The balls go in each bevelled housing. The first sharp hammer-clicks resound. Now streams of greyish powder settle inside the pans. Screwed fast to metal, the jagged flints are set to go. Behind a nearby stump, Guillot takes up his stand in indecision. The duelists shed their cloaks and wait. Zaretsky paces off their fate at thirty steps with fine precision, then leads each man to where he'll stand, and each takes pistol into hand. Approach at will! Advancing coldly, with quiet, firm and measured tread, not aiming yet, the foes took boldly the first four steps that lay ahead, four fateful steps. The space decreasing, Anegin then, while still not ceasing his slow advance, was first to raise his pistol with a level gaze. Five paces more, while Lensky waited to close one eye and only then to take his aim. And that was when Onegin fired. The hour fated has struck at last. The poet stops, and silently his pistol drops. He lays a hand, as in confusion, on breast, and falls. His misted eyes express not pain, but death's intrusion. Thus, Slowly down a sloping rise, and sparkling in the sunlight's shimmer, a clump of snow will fall and glimmer. Eugene, in sudden chill, despairs, runs to the stricken youth, and stares, calls out his name. No earthly power can bring him back. The singer's gone, cut down by fate at break of dawn. 
the storm has blown. The lovely flower has withered with the rising sun. The altar fire is out and done. He lay quite still and past all feeling. His languid brow looked strange at rest. The steaming blood poured forth, revealing the gaping wound beneath his breast. One moment back, a breath's duration, this heart still throbbed with inspiration, its hatreds, hopes, and loves still beat, its blood ran hot with life's own heat. But now, as in a house deserted, inside it all is hushed and stark, gone silent and forever dark. The window boards have been inserted, the panes chalked white. The owners fled, but where, God knows, all trace is dead. With epigrams of spite and daring, it's pleasant to provoke a foe. It's pleasant when you see him staring, his stubborn, thrusting horns held low, unwillingly within the mirror, ashamed to see himself the clearer. More pleasant yet, my friends, if he shrieks out in stupid shock. That's me! Still pleasanter is mute insistence on granting him his resting place by shooting at his pallid face from some quite gentlemanly distance. But once you've had your fatal fun, you won't be pleased to see it done. And what would be your own reaction if with your pistol you'd struck down a youthful friend for some infraction, a bold reply, too blunt a frown, some bagatelle? when he had been drinking? Or what if he himself, not thinking, had called you out in fiery pride? Well, tell me, what would you, inside, be thinking of, or merely feeling, were your good friend before you now, stretched out with death upon his brow, his blood by slow degrees congealing, too deaf and still to make reply to your repeated desperate cry. In anguish, with his heart forsaken, the pistol in his hand like lead, Eugene stared down at Lensky, shaken. His neighbour spoke, Well then, he's dead. The awful word, so lightly uttered, was like a blow. Onegin shuddered, then called his men and walked away. Zaretsky, carefully, then lay the frozen corpse on sleigh, preparing to drive the body home once more. Sensing the dreadful load they bore, the horses neighed, their nostrils flaring, and wet the metal bit with foam, then, swift as arrows, raced for home. You mourn the poet, friends, and rightly, scarce out of infant clothes, and killed. Those joyous hopes that bloomed so brightly, now doomed to wither unfulfilled. Where now the ardent agitation, the fine and noble aspiration of youthful feeling, youthful thought, exalted, tender, boldly wrought? And where are stormy love's desires, the thirst for knowledge, work and fame, the dread of vice, the fear of shame? And where are you, poetic fires. You cherished dreams of sacred worth and pledge of life beyond this earth. It may be he was born to fire the world with good, or earn at least a gloried name. His silenced lyre might well have raised, before it ceased, a call to ring throughout the ages. Perhaps upon the world's great stages he might have scaled a lofty height, his martyred shade, condemned to night, perhaps has carried off forever some sacred truth, a living word, now doomed by death to pass unheard. And in the tomb his shade shall never receive our race's hymns of praise, nor hear the ages bless his days. Or maybe he was merely fated to live amid the common tide, and as his years of youth abated, the flame within him would have died. In time, 
He might have changed profoundly, have quit the muses, married soundly, and in the country he'd have worn a quilted gown and cuckold's horn, and happy he'd have learned life truly. At forty he'd have had the gout, have eaten drunk, grown bored and stout, and so decayed, until he duly passed on in bed, his children round, while women wept and doctors frowned. However, reader, we may wonder, the youthful lover's voice is stilled. His dreams and songs all rent asunder, and he, alas, by friend lies killed. Not far from where the youth once flourished, there lies a spot the poet cherished. Two pine trees grow there, roots entwined. Beneath them, quiet streamlets wind, meandering from the nearby valley. And there the ploughman rests at will, and women reapers come to fill their pitchers in the stream and dally. There, too, within a shaded nook, a simple stone adjoins the brook. Sometimes a shepherd sits there waiting, till on the fields spring rains have passed, and sings of vulgar fishers, plaiting his simple coloured shoes of bast. Or some young girl from town who's spending her summer in the country mending, when headlong and alone on horse she races down the meadow course, will draw her leather reins up tightly to halt just there her panting steed, and lifting up her veil she'll read the plain inscription, skimming lightly, and as she reads a tear will rise and softly dim her gentle eyes and at a walk she'll ride, dejected, into the open field to gaze. Her soul, despite herself infected by Lenski's brief, ill-fated days. She'll wonder, too, did Olga languish, her heart consumed with lasting anguish, or did the time of tears soon pass? And where's her sister now, poor lass? And where that gloomy, strange betrayer, the modish beauty's modish foe, that recluse from the world we know, the youthful poet's friend and slayer? In time, I promise, I'll not fail to tell you all in full detail. But not today. Although I cherish my hero, and of course I vow to see how he may wane or flourish, I'm not quite in the mood just now. The years to solemn prose incline me. The years chase playful rhyme behind me, and I, alas, I must confess, pursue her now a good deal less. My pen has lost its disposition to mar the fleeting page with verse, for other colder dreams I nurse, and sterner cares now seek admission, and mid the hum and hush of life they haunt my soul with dreams of strife. I've learned the voice of new desires, and come to know a new regret. The first within me light no fires, and I lament old sorrows yet. Old dreams, where has your sweetness vanished? And where has youth, glib rhyme, been banished? Can it be true? Its bloom has passed, has withered, withered now at last. Can it be true? My heydays ended, all elegiac play aside, that now indeed my spring has died, as I in jest so oft pretended. And is there no return of youth? Shall I be thirty soon, in truth? And so life's afternoon has started, as I must now admit, I see. But let us then as friends be parted, my sparkling youth, before you flee. I thank you for your host of treasures, for pain and grief as well as pleasures, for storms and feasts and worldly noise, for all your gifts and all your joys, my thanks to you. With you I've tasted amid the tumult and the still life's essence, and enjoyed my fill. Enough. Clear-souled and far from wasted, I start upon an untrod way to take my rest from yesterday. But one glance back. Farewell, you bowers, sweet wilderness, in which I spent impassioned days and idle hours, and filled my soul with dreams content. And you, my youthful inspiration, come, stir the bleak imagination, enrich the slumbering heart's dull load, 
more often visit my abode. Let not the poet's soul grow bitter or harden and congeal alone to turn at last to lifeless stone amid this world's deceptive glitter, this swirling swamp in which we lie and wallow, friends, both you and I. Chapter 7 Moscow Russia's favourite daughter, where is your equal to be found? Dmitriev. Can one not love our native Moscow? Baratinsky. Speak ill of Moscow? So this is what it means to see the world? Where is it better, then? Where we are not. Griboyedov. Spring rays at last begin to muster and chase from nearby hills the snow, whose turbid streams flow down and cluster to inundate the fields below, and drowsy nature, smiling lightly, now greets the dawning season brightly. The heavens sparkle now with blue, the still transparent woods renew their downy green and start to thicken. The bee flies out from waxen cell to claim its mead from field and dell. The veils grow dry and colours quicken, the cattle low, and by the moon the nightingale pours forth its tune. How sad I find your apparition, O oh spring, O oh time of love's unrest! What sombre echoes of ambition then stir my blood and fill my breast? What tender and oppressive yearning possesses me on spring's returning, when in some quiet rural place I feel her breath upon my face? Or am I now inured to gladness, and all that quickens and excites, that sparkles, triumphs and delights, casts only spleen and languid sadness on one whose heart has long been dead, for whom but darkness lies ahead. Or saddened by the re-emergence of leaves that perished in the fall, we heed the rustling wood's resurgence as bitter losses we recall. Or do we mark with lamentation how nature's lively renovation compares with our own fading youth, for which no spring will come in truth? Perhaps in thought we reassemble within a dream to which we cling some other and more ancient spring that sets the aching heart a-tremble with visions of some distant place, a magic night, the moon's embrace. Now is the time, you hibernators, you epicures and sages, you, you fortunate procrastinators, you fledglings from our Yovshin's crew, you rustic priams from the cities, and you, my sentimental pretties, spring calls you to your country seat. It's time for flowers, labours, heat, those heady walks for which you're thirsting, and soft, seductive nights as well. Into the fields, my friends, pell-mell, load up your carriages to bursting, bring out your own or rent a horse, and far from town now set your course. You too, indulgent reader, hurry in your imported coach, I pray, to leave the city with its flurry where you spent winter time in play. And with my willful muse, let's hustle to where the leafy woodlands rustle a nameless river's placid scene, the country place where my Eugene, that idle and reclusive schemer, but recently this winter stayed, not far from our unhappy maid, young Tanya, my enchanted dreamer, but where he now no longer reigns, where only his sad trace remains. Where hills half circle round a valley, let's trace a winding brooklet's flow through greening fields, and watch it dally beside a spot where lindens grow. And there the nightingale, spring's lover, sings out till dawn. A crimson cover of briar blooms and freshets sound. There too a tombstone can be found beneath two pine trees, old for ages, its legend lets the stranger know Vladimir Lensky lies below. 
he died too soon, his death courageous. At such an age, in such a year, repose in peace, young poet, here. There was a time when breezes playing among the pines would gently turn a secret wreath that hung there swaying upon a bough above that urn, and sometimes in the evening hours two maidens used to come with flowers, and by the moonlit grave they kept their vigil and embracing wept. But now the monument stands dreary and quite forgot. Its pathway now all weeds, no wreath is on the bough. Alone the shepherd, grey and weary, beneath it sings as in the past, and plaits his simple shoes of bast. My poor, poor Lensky. Yes, she mourned him, although her tears were all too brief. Alas, his fiancée has scorned him and proved unfaithful to her grief. Another captured her affection, another with his love's perfection has lulled her wretchedness to sleep. A lancer has enthralled her deep, a lancer whom she loves with passion, and at the altar by his side she stands beneath the crown a bride, her head bent down in modest fashion, her lowered eyes aflame the while, and on her lips a slender smile. Poor Lensky, in his place of resting in deaf eternity's grim shade, did he, sad bard, awake protesting the fateful news he'd been betrayed? Or, lulled by Lethe, as he slumbered, his blissful spirit unencumbered by feelings and perturbed no more, his world a closed and silent door? Just so. The tomb that lies before us holds but oblivion in the end. The voice of lover, foe and friend falls silent fast. Alone the chorus of angry airs in hot debate contests obscenely our estate. Soon Olga's happy voice and beauty no longer cheered the family group. A captive of his lot and duty, her lancer had to join his troop. Dame Larin's eyes began to water as she embraced her younger daughter and, scarce alive, cried out goodbye. But Tanya found she couldn't cry. A deathly pallor merely covered her stricken face. When all came out onto the porch and fussed about while taking leave, Tatiana hovered beside the couple's coach below, then sadly saw the lovers go. And long she watched the road they'd taken, as through a mist of stifled tears. Now Tanya is alone, forsaken, companion of so many years, the darling sister whom she'd nourished, the bosom friend she'd always cherished, now carried off by fate, a bride, forever parted from her side. She roams in aimless desolation, now gazes at the vacant park, but all seems joyless, bleak and dark. There's nothing offers consolation or brings her smothered tears relief. Her heart is rent in two by grief. And in the solitude her passion burns even stronger than before. Her heart speaks out in urgent fashion of far away Eugene the more. She'll never see him and be grateful. She finds a brother's slayer hateful and loathes the awful thing he's done. The poet's gone, and hardly one remembers him. His bride's devotion has flown to someone else instead. His very memory now has fled like smoke across an azure ocean. Two hearts, perhaps, remain forlorn and mourn him yet. But wherefore mourn? T'was evening, and the heavens darkled, a beetle hummed. The peasant choirs were bound for home. Still waters sparkled. Across the river smoky fires of fishermen were dimly gleaming. Tatiana walked, alone and dreaming, beneath the moonbeam's silver light, and climbed a gentle hill by night. She walked and walked, till with a shiver she spied a distant hamlet's glow a manor-house and grove below, a garden by the glinting river, and as she gazed upon that place, her pounding heart began to race. 
Assailed by doubts, she grew dejected. Should I go on, turn back, or what? He isn't here, I'm not expected. I'll glance at house and garden plot. And so, scarce breathing, down she hastened and looked about, perplexed and chastened to find herself at his estate. She entered the deserted gate. A pack of barking dogs chased round her, and at her frightened cry a troop of household urchins with a whoop came rushing quickly to surround her. They made the barking hounds obey, then led the lady safe away. "'May I just see the house, I wonder?' asked Tanya, and the children leapt to find Anisia and to plunder the household keys she always kept. Anisia came in just a second, and soon the open doorway beckoned. She stepped inside the empty shell where once our hero used to dwell. She found a cue left unattended upon the table after play, and on a rumpled sofa lay his riding crop, and on she wended. "'And here's the hearth,' spoke up the crone, "'where master used to sit alone. "'Our neighbour Lensky, lately buried, "'would dine with him in winter here. Uh, "'Come this way, please, but don't feel hurried. "'And here's the master's study, dear. "'He slept, took coffee in these quarters, "'would hear the bailiff give his orders, "'and mornings read some book right through. "'My former master lived here too.' On Sundays at his window station, his glasses on, he'd deign to play some cards with me to pass the day. God grant his mortal soul salvation, and may his dear old bones be blessed in Mother Earth, where he's at rest. Tatiana looks in melting pleasure at everything around the room. She finds it all a priceless treasure, a painful joy that lifts her gloom and leaves her languid soul ignited. The desk, the lamp that stands unlighted, the heap of books, the carpet spread before the window on the bed, that semi-light so pale and solemn, the view outdoors, the lunar pall, Lord Byron's portrait on the wall, the iron bust upon its column, with clouded brow beneath a hat, the arms compressed and folded flat. And long she stood, bewitched and glowing, inside that modish bachelor cell, but now it's late. The winds are blowing. It's cold and dark within the dell. The groves are asleep above the river. Behind the hill, the moon's a sliver. And now it's time indeed long past that our young pilgrim leave at last. Concealing her wrought-up condition, though not without a heartfelt sigh, Tatiana turns to say goodbye, but, taking leave, requests permission to see the vacant house alone and read the books he'd called his own. Outside the gate, Tatiana parted from old Anisia. Next day, then, she rose at dawn and off she started to see the empty house again. And once inside that silent study, sealed off at last from everybody, the world for just a time forgot. Tatiana wept and mourned her lot then turned to see the books he had favoured. At first she didn't wish to read. The choice of books seemed strange indeed, but soon her thirsting spirit savoured the mystery that those pages told, and watched a different world unfold. Although Onegin's inclination for books had vanished, as we know, he did exempt from condemnation some works and authors even so the Bard of Juan and the Jawa, and some few novels done with power, in which our age is well displayed and modern man himself portrayed with something of his true complexion, with his immoral soul disclosed, his arid vanity exposed, his endless bent for deep reflection, his cold, embittered mind that seems to waste itself in empty schemes— some pages still preserved the traces where fingernails had sharply pressed. The girl's attentive eye embraces these lines more quickly than the rest, and Tanya sees with trepidation the kind of thought or observation to which Eugene paid special heed, or where he'd tacitly agreed, and in the margins she inspected his pencil marks with special care and on those pages everywhere she found Onegin's soul reflected 
in crosses or a jotted note, or in the question mark he wrote. And so, in slow but growing fashion, my Tanya starts to understand more clearly now, thank God, her passion and him for whom, by fate's command, she'd been condemned to feel desire. That dangerous and sad pariah, that work of heaven or of hell, that angel and proud fiend as well. What was he then? An imitation? An empty phantom or a joke? A Muscovite in Harold's cloak? Compendium of affectation? A lexicon of words in vogue? Mere parody? And just a rogue? Can she have solved the riddle's power? Can she have found the final clue? She hardly notes how late the hour, and back at home she's overdue, where two old friends in conversation speak out on Tanya's situation. What can I do? Tatiana's grown, Dame Larin muttered with a moan. Her younger sister married neatly. It's time that she was settled, too. I swear I don't know what to do. She turns all offers down completely, just says... I can't, then broods away and wanders through those woods all day. Is she in love? With whom, I wonder? Buyanov tried, she turned him down, and Petushkov as well went under. Piktin, the lancer, came from town to stay with us and seemed transported. My word, that little devil courted. I thought she might accept him then, but no, the deal fell through again. "'Why, my dear lady, what's the bother? "'To Moscow and the marriage mart. "'They vacancies galore, take heart. "'But I've so little income, father. "'Sufficient for one winter's stay? "'Or borrow, then, from me, let's say.' "'The good old lady was delighted to hear such sensible advice. "'She checked her funds and then decided a Moscow winter would be nice.' Tatiana heard the news morosely. The haughty world would watch her closely and judge her harshly from the start. Her simple, open country heart and country dress would find no mercy, and antiquated turns of phrase were sure to bring a mocking gaze from every Moscow fop and Circe. Oh, horrors! No, she'd better stay safe in her woods and never stray. With dawn's first rays, Tatiana races out to the open fields to sigh, and gazing softly, she embraces the world she loves and says goodbye. Farewell, my peaceful vales and fountains. Farewell, you too, familiar mountains and woods where once I used to roam. Farewell, celestial beauty's home. Farewell, fond nature where I flourished. I leave your world of quiet joys for empty glitter, fuss and noise. Farewell, my freedom, deeply cherished. Oh, where and why do I now flee, and what does fate prepare for me? And all that final summer season her walks were long. A brook or knoll would stop her now for no good reason except to charm her thirsting soul. As with old friends, she keeps returning to all her groves and meadows, yearning to talk once more and say goodbye. But quickly summer seems to fly, the golden autumn now arriving. Now nature, tremulous, turns pale, a victim draped in lavish veil. The north now howls, the winds are driving the clouds before them far and near. That sorceress, the winter's here. She's spread herself through field and fountain and hung the limbs of oaks with white. She lies atop the farthest mountain in wavy carpets glistening bright. She's levelled with a fluffy blanket both river and the shores that flank it. The frost has gleamed and we give thanks for Mother Winter's happy pranks. But Tanya's heart is far from captured. She doesn't greet the winter's glow, inhale the frost dust, gather snow from bathhouse roof to wash, enraptured, her shoulders, face and breast. With dread, she views the winter path ahead. Departure day was long expected. The final hours come at last. 
The covered sleigh, for years neglected, is checked, relined, and soon made fast. The usual three-cart train will carry what household goods are necessary, the mattresses, the trunks and chairs, some jars of jam and kitchen wares, the feather beds and coops of chickens, some pots and basins and the rest. Well, almost all that they possessed. The servants fussed and raised the dickens about the stable. Many cried. Then eighteen nags were led outside. They're harnessed to the coach and steadied. The cooks make lunch for one and all. The heaped-up wagons now are readied. The wenches and the drivers brawl. Atop a lean and shaggy trotter, the bearded postboy sits as spotter. Retainers crowd the gate pell-mell to bid their mistresses farewell. They're all aboard. And, slowly gliding, the ancient coach creeps out the gate. Farewell, my peaceful home and fate. Farewell, secluded place of hiding. Shall I return? And Tanya sighs as tears well up to dim her eyes. When we have broadened education, the time will come, without a doubt, by scientific computation within five hundred years about, when our old roads' decayed condition will change beyond all recognition— Paved highways linking every side will cross our Russia far and wide. Above our waters, iron bridges will stride in broadly arching sweep. We'll dig bold tunnels neath the deep and even part whole mountain ridges and Christendom will institute an inn at every stage en route. But roads are bad now in our nation. Neglected bridges rot and fall, Bedbugs and fleas at every station won't let the travellers sleep at all. No inns exist. At posting stages they hang pretentious menu pages, but just for show, as if to spite the traveller's futile appetite. While some rude cyclops at his fire treats Europe's dainty artefacts with mighty Russian hammer wax, and thanks the Lord for ruts and mire and all the ditches that abound throughout our native Russian ground. And yet a trip in winter season is often easy, even nice. Like modish verse devoid of reason, the winter road is smooth as ice. Our bold automedons stay cheery, our Russian troikas never weary, and mileposts soothe the idle eye as fence-like they go flashing by. Unluckily, Dame Larin wasted no funds on renting fresher horse, which meant a longer trip, of course, and so our maiden fully tasted her share of travel's dull delights. They rode for seven days and nights. But now... They're near. Before them, gleaming, lies Moscow, with its stones of white, its ancient domes and spires streaming with golden crosses ember bright. Ah, friends, I too have been delighted when all at once, far off, I've sighted that splendid view of distant domes, of churches, belfries, stately homes. How oft, forlorn and separated, when wayward fate has made me stray, I've dreamt of Moscow far away. Ah, Moscow, how that sound is freighted with meaning for our Russian hearts. How many echoes it imparts. And here's Petrovsky Castle, hoary amid its park. In sombre dress it wears with pride its recent glory. Napoleon, drunk with fresh success, awaited here in vain surrender, for kneeling Moscow's hand to tender the ancient Kremlin's hallowed keys. But Moscow never bent her knees, nor bowed her head in subjugation. No welcome feast did she prepare, the restless hero waiting there, but lit instead a conflagration. From here he watched, immersed in thought, the awesome blaze my Moscow wrought. Farewell now, scene of fame unsteady, Petrovsky Castle. Hey, be fleet, there gleam the city gates already. 
and now along Tverskaya Street the sleigh glides over ruts and passes by sentry booths and peasant lasses, by gardens, mansions, fashion shops, past urchins, street lamps, strolling fops, bokharins, sleighs, apothecaries, mujiks and merchants, Cossack guards, past towers, hovels, boulevards, great balconies and monasteries, past gateway lions' lifted paws and crosses dense with flocks of doors. This tiring trek through town extended for two full hours. Then, quite late, nearby St. Chariton's, it ended before a mansion's double gate. For now, they'll seek accommodation with Tanya's aunt, a kind relation, four years consumptive, sad to note, in glasses and a torn old coat, a grizzled Kalmuk came to meet them. With sock in hand, he led the way to where the prostrate princess lay. She called from parlour couch to greet them. The two old ladies hugged and cried with shouts of joy on either side. Princess mon ange, Pachette! Oh, Laura, who would have thought... How long it's been! I hope you'll stay. Dear cousin Laura, sit down. Ah, oh, strange. I can't begin. I'd swear it's from some novel's pages. And here's my Tanya. Lord, it's ages. Oh, Tanya, sweet, come over here. I think I must be dreaming, dear. Oh, cousin, do you still remember your Grandison? I never knew. Oh, Grandison, of course I do. He lives in Moscow. This December, on Christmas Eve, he paid a call. He married off his son this fall. The other... But we'll talk tomorrow, and straightway, too, to all her kin we'll show your Tanya. What a sorrow that paying visits does me in... I drag about like some poor laggard. But here, your trip has left you haggard. Let's all go have a nice long rest. I've got no strength. This weary breast finds even joy at times excessive, not only woe. It's true, my dear. I'm good for nothing now, I fear. When one gets old, life turns oppressive. And all worn out, she wept a bit, then broke into a coughing fit. The sick old lady's kindly smile left Tanya moved, but she felt sad within this strange new domicile and missed the room she had always had. In bed, beneath her silken curtain, she lies there sleepless and uncertain, and early church bells, when they chime, announcing dawn and working time, rouse Tanya from her bed to listen— she sits before the window sill. The darkness wanes, but Tanya still can't see her fields and valleys glisten. She sees an unknown yard instead, a stable, fence, and kitchen shed. And now they trundle Tanya daily to family dinners, just to share with grandams and granduncles gaily her languid and abstracted air. Those kin who've come from distant places are always met with warm embraces, with shouts of joy and welcome cheer. How Tanya's grown! It seems, my dear, so short a time since I baptised you. And since I dried your baby tears. And since I pulled you by the ears. And since my gingerbread surprised you. And with one voice the grannies cry... Good gracious, how the years do fly! In them, though, nothing ever alters. The same old patterns still are met. Old Aunt Elena never falters and wears that same tulle bonnet yet. Still powdered is Lukeria Lvovna, a liar still, Lyubov Petrovna, Ivan Petrovich, no more bright, Semyon Petrovich, just as tight, and Anna Pavlovna, as ever, still has her friend, Monsieur Finmouche, her same old spouse and same old pooch, her husband, clubman come whatever, is just as meek and deaf, it's true, and still consumes enough for two. 
Their daughters, after brief embraces, look Tanya over, good and slow. In silence, Moscow's youthful graces examine her from head to toe. They find her stranger than expected, a bit provincial and affected, and somewhat pale, too thin and small, but on the whole, not bad at all. Then, bowing to innate compassion, they squeeze her hand, and in the end take Tanya in and call her friend. They fluff her curls in latest fashion, and in their sing-song tones impart their girlish secrets of the heart. Both others and their own successes, their hopes and pranks and maiden dreams, all innocence, their talk progresses, though now and then some gossip gleams. And then they ask, in compensation for their sweet flow of revelation, for her confessions of romance. But Tanya, in a kind of trance, attends their giddy conversation without response and takes no part. And all the while she guards her heart with silence and in meditation. Her cherished trove of tears and bliss she'll share with none aloud like this. Tatiana tries to pay attention when in the parlour guests converse, but all they ever seem to mention is incoherent rot, or worse. They seem so pallid and so weary, and even in their slander dreary. In all the sterile words they use, in arid gossip, questions, news, not once all day does thought but flicker, not even in some chance remark. The languid mind will find no spark, the heart no cause to beat the quicker, and even simple-minded fun this hollow world has learned to shun. Archival dandies in a cluster eye Tanya with a priggish frown, and with their usual sort of bluster among themselves they put her down. One melancholy joker found her his true ideal and hovered round her, then, leaning by the door, prepared an elegy to show he cared. Once Vyazimsky sat down beside her, on meeting her at some dull aunt's, and managed to dispel her trance, and some old man, when he espied her, put straight his wig and asked around about this unknown bell he'd found. But where Melpomene still stages her stormy scenes and wails aloud, and in her gaudy mantle rages before the dull and frigid crowd, where sweet Thalia calmly dozes, indifferent to admirers' roses, where just Terpsichore enchants the youthful lover of the dance, as was the case, for nothing passes in our day too, let's not forget, no jealous lady trained lorgnette, no modish connoisseur his glasses, to spy on Tanya down below, from boxes rising row on row. They take her to the grand assembly, and there the crush, the glare, the heat, the music's roar, the ballroom trembling, the whirling flash of pairs of feet, the beauties in their filmy dresses, the swarming gallery throng that presses the host of girls on marriage hunts, assault the senses all at once. Here practice dandies bow and slither to show their gall, and waistcoats too, with negligent lorgnettes in view. Hussars on leave come racing hither to strut their stuff and thunder by, to dazzle, conquer, and to fly. The night has countless stars to light her, and Moscow countless beauties too. And yet the regal moon shines brighter than all her friends in heaven's blue, and she, whose beauty I admire, but dare not bother with my lyre, just like the moon upon her throne, mid wives and maidens, shines alone. With what celestial pride she grazes the earth she walks in splendour dressed. What languor fills her lovely breast, how sensuous her wondrous gazes. But there, enough, have done at last. You've paid your due to follies past. Commotion bows, the glad, the solemn, gallop, mazurka, waltz, and there, between two aunts, beside a column, observed by none and near despair, Tatiana looks with eyes unseeing and loathes this world with 
all her being. She's stifled here, and in her mind calls up the life she left behind. The countryside, poor village neighbours, a distant and secluded nook beside a limpid flowing brook, her flowers, novels, daily labours, that dusky linden-shaded walk where he and she once had their talk. And so, far off in thought she wandered, the monde, the noisy ball, forgot. But all the while, as Tanya pondered, some generals stared her way a lot. The aunts exchanged a wink and nodded, and with an elbow each one prodded Tatiana, whispering in her ear, "'Look quickly to your left, my dear.' "'My left? But why? It seems like gawking. Just never mind. Now, look up there. That group in front. You see that pair in uniform? The one not talking? He just moved off. He's turning round!' "'That heavy general?' Tanya frowned. But here let's honour with affection my Tanya's conquest taking wing, and steer for now a new direction, lest I forget of whom I sing, on which herewith these observations. I sing strange whims and aberrations, I sing a youthful friend of mine. Oh, muse of epics, may you shine on my long work as I grow older, and armed with your good staff, I pray, may I not roam too far astray. Enough. The burden's off my shoulder. To classicism I've been true. The foreword's here, if overdue. Chapter 8 Fare thee well, and if forever, still forever, fare thee well. Byron In days when I still bloomed serenely inside our lycée garden wall and read my Apuleius keenly, but read no Cicero at all, those springtime days in secret valleys where swans call out and beauty dallies near waters sparkling in the still, the muse first came to make me thrill. My student cell turned incandescent, and there the muse spread out for me a feast of youthful fancies free, and sang of childhood effervescent the glory of our days of old, the trembling dreams the heart can hold. And with a smile the world caressed us. What wings our first successes gave! The old de Javin saw and blessed us as he descended to the grave. And I, who saw my single duty as heeding passion's siren song to share with all the world her beauty, would take my merry muse along to rowdy feasts and altercations, the bane of midnight sentry stations, and to each mad and fevered rout she brought her gifts and danced about, bacanty like at all our revels. And over wine she sang for guests, and in those days, when I was blessed, the young pursued my muse like devils, while I, mid friends, was drunk with pride, my flighty mistress at my side. But from that band I soon departed, and fled afar, and she as well. How often on the course I charted my gentle muse's magic spell would light the way with secret stories. How oft, mid far Caucasia's glories, like fair Lenore on moonlit nights, she rode with me those craggy heights. How often on the shores of Taurus, on misty eaves, she led me down to hear the sea's incessant sound, the Nereid's eternal chorus, that endless chant the waves unfurled in praise of him who made the world. Forgetting, then, the city's splendour, its noisy feasts and grand events, in sad Moldavia she turned tender and visited the humble tents of wandering tribes, and like a child she learned their ways and soon grew wild. The language of the gods she shed for strange and simple tongues instead, to sing the savage step, elated. But then her course abruptly veered, and in my garden she appeared, a country miss, infatuated with mournful air and brooding glance, and in her hands 
a French romance. And now I seize the first occasion to show my muse a grand soiree. I watch with jealous trepidation her rustic charms on full display, and lo, my beauty calmly passes through ranks of men from high-born classes, past diplomats and soldier fops and haughty dames, then calmly stops to sit and watch the grand procession, the gowns, the talk, the milling mass, the slow parade of guests who pass before the hostess in succession, the sombre men who form a frame around each painted bell and dame. She likes the stately disposition of oligarchic colloquies, their chilly pride in high position, the mix of years and ranks she sees. But who is that among the chosen? That figure, standing mute and frozen, that stranger no one seems to know. Before him faces come and go like spectres in a bleak procession. What is it, martyred pride or spleen that marks his face? Is that Eugene, that figure with the strange expression? Can that be he? It is, I say. But when did fate cast him our way? Is he the same, or is he learning, or does he play the outcast still? In what new guise is he returning? What role does he intend to fill? Child Harold? Melmoth for a while? Cosmopolite, a Slavophile, a Quaker, bigot, might one ask? Or will he sport some other mask? Or maybe he's just dedicated, like you and me, to being nice. In any case, here's my advice. Give up a role when it's outdated. He's gulled the world. Now let it go. You know him, then? Well, yes and no. But why on earth does he inspire so harsh and negative a view? Is it because we never tire of censuring what others do? Because an ardent spirit's daring appears absurd or overbearing from where the smug and worthless sit? Because the dull are cramped by wit? Because we take mere talk for action and malice rules a petty mind? Because in tripe the solemn find a cause for solemn satisfaction, and mediocrity alone is what we like and call our own. Oh, blessed who in his youth was tender, and blessed who ripened in his prime, who learned to bear without surrender the chill of life with passing time, who never knew exotic visions, nor scorned the social mob's decisions, who was at twenty fop or swell, and then at thirty married well, at fifty shed all obligation for private and for other debts, who gained in turn without regrets great wealth and rank and reputation, of whom lifelong the verdict ran, Old X is quite a splendid man. How sad! that youth, with all its power, was given us in vain to burn, that we betrayed it every hour and were deceived by it in turn, that all our finest aspirations, our brightest dreams and inspirations, have withered with each passing day like leaves dank autumn rots away. It's hard to face a long succession of dinners stretching out of sight, to look at life as at a right, and trail the seemly crowd's procession, indifferent to the views they hold, and to their passions ever cold. When one becomes the butt of rumour, it's hard to bear, as you well know. When men of reason and good humour perceive you as a freak on show, or as a sad and raving creature, a monster of satanic feature, or even demon of my pen, Eugene to speak of him again, who'd killed his friend for satisfaction, who in an aimless, idle fix had reached the age of twenty-six, annoyed with leisure and inaction, without position, work or wife, could find no purpose for his life. He felt a restless, vague ambition, a craving for a change of air, a most unfortunate condition, a cross not many choose to bear, 
He left his home in disillusion and fled the woods and field seclusion where every day before his eyes a bloody spectre seemed to rise. He took up travel for distraction, a single feeling in his breast. But journeys, too, like all the rest, soon proved a wearisome attraction. So he returned one day to fall, like Chatsky, straight from boat to ball. But look! The crowds are stir and humming, a murmur through the ballroom steals. The hostess sees a lady coming, a stately general at her heels. She isn't hurried or obtrusive, is neither cold nor too effusive. She casts no brazen glance around and makes no effort to astound or use those sorts of affectation and artifice that ladies share, but shows a simple quiet air. She seems the very illustration du comme il faut. Shishkov, be kind. I can't translate this phrase, I find. The ladies flocked to stand beside her. Old women beamed as she went by. The men bowed lower when they spied her and sought in vain to catch her eye. Young maidens hushed in passing by her while none held head and shoulders higher than he who brought the lady there, the general with the prideful air. One couldn't label her a beauty, but neither did her form contain, from head to toe, the slightest strain of what, with fashion sense of duty, the London social sets decry as vulgar. I won't even try to find an adequate translation for this delicious epithet. With us, the word's an innovation, but though it's won no favour yet, t'would make an epigram of style. But where's our lady all this while? With carefree charm and winsome air, she took a seat beside the chair of brilliant Nina Voronskaya, that Cleopatra of the North. But even Nina, shining forth with all her marble beauty's fire, however dazzling to the sight, could not eclipse her neighbour's light. Can it be true? Eugene reflected. Can that be she? It seems, and yet, from those backwoods. And he directed a curious and keen lorgnette for several minutes in succession upon the lady whose expression called up a face from long ago. "'But tell me, Prince, you wouldn't know who's standing there in conversation beside the Spanish envoy, pray? That um, lady in the red beret?' "'You have been out of circulation, but I'll present you now with joy. Who is she, though?' "'My wife, old boy!' "'You're married? Really? On my honour. "'To whom? How long? Some two years since. "'The Larin girl. You mean Tatiana? "'She knows you? Uh, we were neighbours, Prince. "'Well, then, come on, we'll go and meet her.' "'And so the Prince led up to greet her his kinsman and his friend Eugene. "'The Princess looked at him, serene.' However much the situation disturbed her soul and caused her pain, however great her shock or strain, she gave no hint of agitation. Her manner stayed the same outside. Her bow was calm and dignified. It's true. The lady didn't shiver or blush, or suddenly turn white, or even let an eyebrow quiver or press her lips together tight. Although Eugene, with care, inspected this placid lady, he detected no trace of Tanya from the past. And when he tried to speak at last, he found he couldn't. She inquired when he'd arrived, and if of late he'd been back home at his estate, then gave her spouse a look so tired he took her arm. She moved away and left Eugene in mute dismay. Was this the Tanya he once scolded in that forsaken distant place where first our novel's plot unfolded? The one to whom, when face to face, in such a burst of moral fire, he'd lectured gravely on desire? The girl whose letter he still kept, in which a maiden heart had wept? Where all was shown, all unprotected, was this, that girl, or did he dream? 
That little girl, whose warm esteem and humble lot he'd once rejected, and could she now have been so bold, so unconcerned with him, so cold? He left the rout in all its splendour and drove back home immersed in thought. A swarm of dreams, both sad and tender, disturbed the slumber that he sought. He woke to find, with some elation, Prince N. had sent an invitation. Oh, God, I'll see her, and today. Oh, yes, I'll go. And straight away he scrawled a note he'd be delighted. What's wrong with him? He's in a daze. What's stirring in that idle gaze? What's made that frigid soul excited? Vexation? Pride? Or youth's old yen? For all the cares of love again? Once more he counts the hours, pacing. Once more can't wait till day is past. The clock strikes ten and off he's racing. And now he's at the porch at last. He enters in some apprehension. The princess, to his added tension, is quite alone. Some minutes there they sit. Eugene can only stare. He has no voice. Without a smile and ill at ease, he scarcely tries to answer her. His mind supplies but one persistent thought the while. His eyes retain their stare, but she sits unconstrained, quite calm and free. Her husband enters, thus arresting this most unpleasant tete-a-tete. -tete. Eugene and he recalled the jesting, the pranks and fun when first they'd met. They laughed. Then guests began arriving, and on the spice of malice thriving, the conversation sparkled bright. The hostess kept the banter light and quite devoid of affectations. Good, reasoned talk was also heard, but not a trite or vulgar word. No lasting truths or dissertations, and no one's ears were shocked a bit by all the flow of lively wit. The social cream had gathered gaily, the nobly born and fashion's pets, the faces one encounters daily, the fools one never once forgets, the aged ladies decked in roses, in bonnets and malignant poses, and several maidens far from gay, unsmiling faces on display. And here's an envoy speaking slyly of some most solemn state affair. A greybeard, too, with scented hair, who joked both cleverly and wryly in quite a keen, old-fashioned way, which seems a touch absurd today. And here's a chap whose words are biting, who's cross with everything about, with tea too sweet to be inviting, with banal ladies, men who shout, that foggy book they're all debating, the badge on those two maids in waiting, the falsehood in reviews, the war, the snow, his wife, and much, much more. And here's Prolazov, celebrated for loathsomeness of soul, a clown, as you, Saint Priest, have demonstrated in album drawings all through town. Another ballroom king on station, like fashion's very illustration, beside the door stood tightly laced, immobile, mute and cherub-faced, a traveller, home from distant fairing, a brazen chap, all starched and proud, provoked amusement in the crowd by his pretentious, studied bearing, a mere exchange of looks conveyed the sorry sight the fellow made. But my Eugene, all evening he did Tatiana, only her alone. But not the timid maid who'd pleaded, that poor enamoured girl he'd known, but this cool princess so resplendent, this distant goddess so transcendent, who ruled the queenly neighbour's shore. Alas, we humans all ignore our mother Eve's disastrous history, What's given to us ever palls, incessantly the serpent calls and lures us to the tree of mystery. We've got to have forbidden fruit, or Eden's joys for us are moot. How changed Tatiana is! How surely she's taken up the role she plays! How quick she's mastered! How securely her lordly ranks commanding ways! 
Who would dare to seek the tender maiden in this serene and glory-laden grand dame of lofty social spheres? Yet once he had moved her heart to tears. Her virgin brooding once had cherished sweet thoughts of him in darkest night, while Morphia still roamed in flight, and gazing at the moon she'd nourished a tender dream that she some day might walk with him life's humble way. To love all ages yield surrender, but to the young its raptures bring a blessing bountiful and tender, as storms refresh the fields of spring. Neath passion's reins they green and thicken, Renew themselves with joy and quicken, And vibrant life in taking root Sends forth rich blooms and gives sweet fruit. But when the years have made us older, And barren age has shown its face, How sad is faded passion's trace! Thus storms in autumn, blowing colder, turn meadows into marshy ground, and strip the forest bare all round. Alas, it's true, Eugene's demented, in love with Tanya like a boy. He spends each day and night tormented by thoughts of love, by dreams of joy. Ignoring reason's condemnation, each day he rides to take his station outside her glassed-in entryway, then follows her about all day. He's happy just to be around her, to help her with her shawl or furs, to touch a torrid hand to hers, to part the footmen who surround her in liveried ranks where'er she calls, or fetch the kerchief when it falls. She pays him not the least attention no matter what he tries to do. At home, receives him without tension, in public, speaks a word or two, or sometimes merely bows on meeting, or passes by without a greeting. She's no coquette in any part. The monde abhors a fickle heart. Onegin, though, is fading quickly. She doesn't see or doesn't care. Onegin, wasting, has the air of one consumptive, wan and sickly. He's urged to seek his doctor's view, and these suggest a spa or two. But he refused to go. He's ready to join his forebears any day. Tatiana, though, stayed calm and steady. Their sex, alas, is hard to sway. And yet he's stubborn, still resistant, still hopeful, and indeed persistent. Much bolder than most healthy men, he chose, with trembling hand, to pen the princess an impassioned letter. Though on the whole he saw no sense in missives writ in love's defence, and with good cause, he found it better than bearing all his pain unheard. So here's his letter, word for word. Onegin's Letter to Tatiana I know you'll feel a deep distress at this unwanted revelation. What bitter scorn and condemnation your haughty glance may well express. What aims, what hopes do I envision in opening my soul to you? What wicked and deserved derision perhaps I give occasion to? When first I met you and detected a warmth in you quite unexpected, I dared not trust in love again. I didn't yield to sweet temptation, and had, it's true, no inclination to lose my hateful freedom then. What's more, poor, guiltless Lenski perished, and his sad fate drew us apart. From all that I had ever cherished, I tore away my grieving heart. Estranged from men and discontented, I thought, in freedom, peace of mind, a substitute for joy I'd find. How wrong I've been, and how tormented. But no, each moment of my days to see you and pursue you madly, to catch your smile and search your gaze with loving eyes that seek you gladly, to melt with pain before your face, to hear your voice, to try to capture with all my soul your perfect grace, to swoon and pass away. What rapture! And I'm deprived of this. For you I search on all the paths I wander. Each day is dear, each moment too. 
yet I in futile dullness squander these days allotted me by fate. Oppressive days indeed of late. My span on earth is all but taken, but lest too soon I join the dead, I need to know, when I awaken, I'll see you in the day ahead. I fear that in this meek petition your solemn gaze may only spy the cunning of a base ambition, and I can hear your stern reply. But if you knew the anguish in it, to thirst with love in every part, to burn, and with the mind each minute to calm the tumult in one's heart, to long to clasp in adoration your knees, and sobbing at your feet, pour out confessions, lamentation, oh, all that I might then entreat. And meantime, feigning resignation, to arm my gaze and speech with lies, to look at you with cheerful eyes, and hold a placid conversation, but let it be. It's now too late for me to struggle at this hour. The die is cast. I'm in your power, and I surrender to my fate. No answer came. Eugene elected to write again, and then once more, with no reply. He drives, dejected, to some soiree, and by the door sees her at once. Her harshness stuns him. Without a word, the lady shuns him. My God! God, how stern that haughty brow! What wintry frost surrounds her now! Her lips express determination to keep her fury in control. Onegin stares with all his soul. But where's distress, commiseration, and where the tear stains? Not a trace. There's wrath alone upon that face. And, may be, secret apprehension, lest Mond or husband misconstrue an episode too slight to mention, the tale that my Onegin knew. But he departs, his hopes in tatters, and damns his folly in these matters, and plunging into deep despond, he once again rejects the Mond. And he recalled with grim emotion, Behind his silent study door, how wicked spleen had once before pursued him through the world's commotion, had seized him by the collar then, and locked him in a darkened den. Once more he turned to books and sages. He read his Gibbon and Rousseau, Chamfort, Manzoni, Herder's pages, Madame de Stael, Bichat, Tissot, the sceptic Bale he quite devoured, the works of Fontenelle he scoured. He even read some Russians, too. Nor did he scorn the odd review, those journals where each modern Moses instructs us in a moral way, where I'm so much abused today but where such madrigals and roses I used to meet with now and then. E sempre bene, gentlemen. And yet, although his eyes were reading, his thoughts had wandered far apart. Desires, dreams, and sorrows pleading had crowded deep within his heart. Between the printed lines lay hidden quite other lines that rose unbidden before his gaze, and these alone absorbed his soul, as he was shown the heart's dark secrets and traditions, the mysteries of its ancient past, disjointed dreams obscure and vast, vague threats and rumours, premonitions, a drawn-out tale of fancies grand, and letters in a maiden's hand. But then... As torpor dulled sensation, his feelings and his thoughts went slack, while in his mind imagination dealt out her motley pharaoh pack. He sees a youth, quite still, reposing on melting snow, as if he's dozing on bivouac, then hears with dread a voice proclaim, "'Well, then, he's dead!' He sees forgotten foes he'd bested, base cowards, slanderers full-blown, unfaithful women he had known, companions whom he now detested, a country house, a window-sill, where she sits waiting, waiting still. 
He got so lost in his depression, he just about went mad, I fear, or else turned poet, an obsession that I'd have been the first to cheer. It's true, by self-hypnotic action, my muddled pupil in distraction came close to grasping at that time the principles of Russian rhyme. He looked the poet so completely, when by the hearth he'd sit alone, and Benedetto he'd intone, or sometimes Idolmio sweetly, while on the flames he'd drop unseen his slipper or his magazine. The days flew by. The winter season dissolved amid the balmy air. He didn't die, or lose his reason, or turn a poet in despair. With spring he felt rejuvenated. The cell in which he'd hibernated so marmot-like through winter's night, the hearth, the double panes shut tight, he quit one sparkling morn and sprinted along the neighbor's bank by sleigh. On hacked-out bluish ice that lay beside the road the sunlight glinted. The rutted snow had turned to slush. But where, in such a headlong rush, has my Eugene directly hastened? You've guessed already. Yes, indeed, the moody fellow, still unchastened, has flown to Tanya's in his need. He enters like a dead man, striding through empty hall, then passes, gliding through grand salon, and on, all bare, he opens up a door. What's there that strikes him with such awful pleading? The princess sits alone in sight, quite unadorned, her face gone white above some letter that she's reading, and cheek in hand as down she peers, she softly sheds a flood of tears. In that brief instant, then, who couldn't have read her tortured heart at last? And in the princess, then, who wouldn't have known poor Tanya from the past? Mad with regret and anguished feeling, Eugene fell down before her, kneeling. She shuddered, but she didn't speak, just looked at him, her visage bleak without surprise or indignation. His stricken, sick, extinguished eyes, imploring aspect, mute replies, she saw it all. In desolation, the simple girl he'd known before, who'd dreamt and loved, was born once more. Her gaze upon his face still lingers. She does not bid him rise or go, does not withdraw impassive fingers from avid lips that press them so. What dreams of hers were re-enacted? The heavy silence grew protracted until at last she whispered low, Enough, get up. To you I owe a word of candid explanation. Onegin, do you still retain some memory of that park and lane where fate once willed our confrontation, and I so meekly heard you preach? It's my turn now to make a speech. Onegin, I was then much younger, I dare say better looking too, and loved you with a girlish hunger. But what did I then find in you? What answer came? Just stern rejection. A little maiden's meek affection to you, I'm sure, was trite and old. Oh, God, my blood can still turn cold when I recall how you reacted. Your frigid glance, that sermonette. But I can't blame you or forget how nobly, in a sense, you acted, how right toward me that awful day. I'm grateful now in every way. Back then, far off from vain commotion in our backwoods, as you'll allow, you had no use for my devotion. So why do you pursue me now? Why mark me out for your attention? Is it perhaps my new ascension to circles that you find more swank, or that I now have wealth and rank, or that my husband, maimed in battle, is held in high esteem at court? Or would my fall, perhaps, be sport, a cause for all the monde to tattle, which might in turn bring you some claim to social scandal's kind of fame? I'm weeping. Oh, at this late hour, if you recall your Tanya still, then know that were it in my power, 
I'd much prefer words harsh and chill, stern censure in your former fashion, to this offensive show of passion, to all these letters and these tears. Oh, then at least my tender years aroused in you some hint of kindness. You pitied then my girlish dreams, but now... What unbecoming schemes have brought you to my feet? What blindness! Can you, so strong of mind and heart, now stoop to play so base a part? To me, Onegin, all these splendours, this weary, tinselled life of mine, this homage that the great world tenders, my stylish house where princes dine, are empty. I'd as soon be trading this tattered life of masquerading, this world of glitter, fumes and noise, for just my books, the simple joys of our old home, its walks and flowers, for all those haunts that I once knew, where first, Onegin, I saw you, for that small churchyard's shaded bowers, where over my poor nanny now there stands a cross beneath a bough. And happiness was ours, so nearly, it came so close. But now my fate has been decreed. I may have merely been foolish when I failed to wait. But mother, with her lamentation, implored me, and in resignation, all futures seemed alike in woe, I married. Now I beg you, go! I faith in you and do not tremble. I know that in your heart reside both honour and a manly pride. I love you. Why should I dissemble? But I am now another's wife, and I'll be faithful all my life. She left him then. Eugene, forsaken, stood seared, as if by heaven's fire. How deep his stricken heart is shaken, with what a tempest of desire. A sudden clink of spurs rings loudly as Tanya's husband enters proudly, and here, at this unhappy turn for my poor hero, we'll adjourn and leave him, reader, at his station for long, forever. In his train we've roamed the world down one slim lane for long enough. Congratulation on reaching land at last. Hooray! And long since time, I'm sure you'd say. Whatever, reader, your reaction, and whether you be foe or friend, I hope we part in satisfaction as comrades now. Whatever end you may have sought in these reflections, tumultuous, fond recollections, relief from labours for a time, live images or wit in rhyme, or maybe merely faulty grammar, God grant that in my careless art, for fun, for dreaming, for the heart, for raising journalistic clamour, you found at least a crumb or two. And so let's part. Farewell. Adieu. Farewell you too, my moody neighbour, and you, my true ideal, my own, and you, small book, my constant labour, in whose bright company I've known all that a poet's soul might cherish. Oblivion, when tempests flourish, sweet talk with friends on which I've fed. Oh, many, many days have fled since young Tatiana, with her lover, as in a misty dream at night, first floated dimly into sight. And I as yet could not uncover, or through the magic crystal see, my novel's shape, or what would be. But those to whom, as friends and brothers, my first few stanzas I once read, some are no more, and distant others, as Sadi long before us said, without them my Onegans fashioned, and she from whom I drew impassioned my fair Tatiana's noblest trait, oh, much, too much you've stolen fate. But blessed is he who rightly gauges the time to quit the feast, and fly, who never drained life's chalice dry, nor read its novel's final pages, but all at once, for good, withdrew, as I, from my Onegin, do.